Hey everyone, welcome back to the Majesty of Reason. I'm Joe Schmid, and today I'm going to be responding to Trent Horn's debate with Ben Watkins at the Capturing Christianity Conference, CCV1. It's going to be highly epic, so let's dig in. And I'm not editing this as I normally do, so let me just click play on the intro. Let's do this. Don't you just love that? <laughs> All right, so I made a document for this, and we're just going to be going through the document, okay? So, response to Trent Horn's case for God. So here are some preliminaries. First, well, I'm going to be going quite quick with this because we've got a lot to get through, so buckle up. It's going to be very juicy. First, I love Trent, right? I love his attitude. I love the fact that he's a truth seeker, and to that extent, we are on the same team here, right? We're trying to search truths about the ultimate nature of reality. Second, no, the title is not clickbait, right? I'll be giving arguments later on against his version of the Kalam to the effect that they're actually incompatible with Christianity. So stay tuned. Third, I've watched everything in this debate up through the second rebuttals. I haven't listened to the discussion section or the Q&A. I got too excited about everything up through the second rebuttals that I simply couldn't handle waiting any longer to make this document and video. Now, don't worry if something comes up in the discussion sections or the Q&A that is germane to my points. I will make a follow-up blog post addressing it. And I've got a new website coming soon, but um, yeah, you can click on this link to, to see my website. So fourthly, I will not be responding to Ben's opening. I have problems with it, many problems, and note that this is bolded and italicized. That tis the nature of being an agnostic, right? But I only have time to address Trent's. Maybe at some future time I'll address Ben's with a little smiley face. Okay, format. So the, sec the sections here are demarcated chronologically, following Trent's opening statement and the subsequent statements as well, like the first or first and second rebuttals. Second, there's going to be a resource abundance that you guys can click uh, and you know look into. Third, I'm going to be giving exact or near exact quotes. So when I say exact or near exact, I might be clipping out a parenthetical remark when I quote someone, and I might not indicate that. Or I might be, you know, making what they say, I might be taking out an or, or an um, or something along those lines. So don't, you know, castigate me, don't uh, reprimand me for, um, you know, not adequately exactly quoting something that someone said. Um, but they're going to be near exact quotes. Link to this document is in the description. And finally, Trent will be responding to my previous response that I did maybe, uh, I don't know how long it was ago, maybe nine months ago or something. Um, it was back when he debated uh, Alex O'Connor, a cosmic skeptic. So he'll be responding to that on Monday, this Monday, and then I'll respond to him hopefully by the following weekend, if not, hopefully by the next few weekends. So keep that on your radar. But now let's get into the opening statement itself, and in particular, his definition of God. And again, like I said, you guys are just going to have to deal with this because we're going to be going quickly through this. I've got a lot to get through. So God, definition. Trent begins by saying that God is being itself. Now, I'm not going to dwell much on this here, but I will say that this faces quite serious independent problems. I've published some of these and publicized many others. I develop an argument from abstracta against this view in my forthcoming article here. I develop numerous arguments from abstracta against this view, building on those from Christopher Menzel, Anderson and Welty, Lorraine Keller, Tyron Goldschmidt, as well as an argument from Changing Knowledge in my book Existential Inertia and Classical Theistic Proofs. That book is currently under review at different academic presses. I also developed two problems, one from intentional action and one from divine providence at the end of my article entitled The Fruitful Death of Modal Collapse Arguments. I actually discuss this at more length on Parker's Pensy's podcast. He intentionally mispronounces that, by the way. Uh, it's an excellent podcast, and I recommend you click on this because that takes you to the discussion that we had. And I also have a paper under review developing these two problems in much more detail. I develop a knowledge-based modal collapse argument in this paper here. I discuss 16 or so and defend 12 to 13 or so modal collapse arguments, as well as a variety of arguments from abstracta in my video Arguments Against Classical is in part one out of three. Parts two and three are coming sometime within the next months. I don't know. Maybe, you know, I'm, I'm a full-time student, so, so don't bother me about it. <laughs> and so on. And so on. Right? And so on. Capitalist ideology. So what's the purpose in mentioning these? Well, I'm not saying Trent must engage with them, and I'm simply just giving you tools to help explore the nature of reality. And it also points to a potential Morian argument, right? Any argument for such a view if successful entails the big four. Uh, view, as in the view of God that Trent lays out divine simplicity, timelessness, and blah blah blah. But even if one cannot pinpoint precisely where an argument goes wrong, one is well within one's epistemic rights in denying the conclusion and inferring the disjunction and the negations of the premises, so long as one has str sufficiently strong independent reason to think that the conclusion is false. And that's going to be met with a lot of people. 
So basically, here's the structure of the Morian argument, and this is well known in the literature. This is a perfectly kosher dialectical move. So now let's get on to the argument for motion or change, that is to say. Okay, so one, change exists. Two, change involves the actualization of a potential. Three, no potential can actualize itself. Four, any change is caused by something actual. Five, anything that is changing has its potential for existence, actualized by something else. Six, there cannot be an infinite chain of actualizers, and from those, it is purported to follow that there must be a first actualizer. Now, this first actualizer cannot have any potential, and so it must be an unactualized actualizer, or that which is pure act. But that is God, and hence, God exists. All right, so first here are some resources, since I've addressed this argument ad nauseum elsewhere, my IJPR article, my Sophia article on the Aristotelian proof, because by the way, this is basically, well, this is just Phaser's Aristotelian proof, pretty much. Um, Phaser on Schmidt on the, on the Aristotelian proof, Phaser on Schmidt on existential inertia, comprehensive response. I highly recommend reading these two blog posts. And then this blog post, which is like a must read to anyone who's interested in existential inertia, so you think you understand existential inertia. It's about, well, it's a really long, systematic, in-depth study of existential inertia, where I address pretty much all the extant objections to existential inertia in the literature from Phaser, Gavin Kerr, Stephen Nemesh, and so on. Uh, and I also discuss, you know, um, all four of Phaser's causal proofs in there. I discuss the Deante argument from essence, existence, distinction, and so on. My video, Phaser's Aristotelian Proof and Analysis, and this chapter of my book, Systematically Appraising the Aristotelian Proof. Now, this chapter has been slightly updated since I made the link, but blah, blah, blah. Okay, so I won't rehearse all my objections. I'll pick some salient ones. So let's look at Trent's justification. So importantly, Trent doesn't justify premise two. That's the That says that change is the actualization of a potential, right? Change involves the actualization of a potential. He doesn't justify it, just asserts it and gives some examples of change and then just asserts that their changes are actualizations of potentials. Now, this is extremely important, right? This is a highly contentious and a very minority view in, I know I'm not speaking correct, grammatical English here, grammatical, anyway, uh, but that's a, that's a highly contentious view in metaphysics, and that should at least be recognized. Um, I'm not saying that Trent has to stop and, you know, pause and say that, oh, I am here espousing a, a, a controversial view. I'm not saying that, but I just want to put, put this on your radar, um, that firstly, he just asserts it. Secondly, it's a substantive metaphysical position that needs to be justified if we want his argument to succeed, and yet he gives no such justification, and so his argument doesn't succeed. Uh, and nowhere in his opening statement or his first or second rebuttals does he give any such justification. So we could just leave it at that, right? We could just move on to a different argument, but we're not going to, um, yeah, we're just going <laughs> to, we're going to stay here and we're going to camp out. Now, I actually, um, uh, I actually have done stuff with regard to premise two, so change involves the actualization potential. Arguably, this is going to require that actuality and potentiality, as Phaser points out on pages like 176 to 184 of his book, this is going to require that act and potency are different ways of being. They're different kinds of existence. There's actual being, and there, then there's something different. There's potential being. But that requires pluralism about being. Uh, but there are some serious challenges to pluralism about being. For instance, see my video with Dr. Trenton Merricks on my channel, um, where, where we argue for ontological monism, where there is only one way of being. And that would equally count against this analysis of change. You can also see my blog post, uh, my recent blog post, where I respond to Phaser's argument for this act potency analysis of change. Okay, uh, now... Trent also doesn't justify premise 5 in his opening statement, he just asserts it. Now that's strange, given that it's one of the argument's cruxes, but perhaps he prearranged something with Ben, I don't know. In any case, it's just asserted, premise 5, anything that is changing has its potential for existence actualized by something else. That's the demand for a sustaining cause, which makes it exceedingly strange that it wasn't justified. But again, maybe he uh, arranged something in advance with Ben, right? Uh, okay, so on premise 8, Trent says, since an infinite regress of concurrent causes is impossible, the first cause must not rely on anything else to actualize its own potential to exist. In that respect, it must be pure existence, or pure actuality itself. Now, this is a non sequitur. As I put it elsewhere, uh, I will argue that the Aristotelian proof's inference of the unactualized actualizers being purely actual is a non sequitur on numerous fronts. I'll develop this point in connection to two different readings of the causal principle at play within the Aristotelian proof. And again, because I'm, I'm talking about the Aristotelian proof here because it's rather obvious that this is precisely what Trent is drawing on and um, adducing and, and, and defending here. And so let's get a grip on uh, Phaser's inference from unactualized to purely actual actualizer. So Phaser writes, what it means for such a series to have a first member is that there is something which can impart causal power to the other members of the series without having to have that power imparted to it, something that has its causal power in a built-in or non-derivative way. Now, since what is being explained in this case is the actualization of a thing's potential for existence, the sort of first cause we're talking about is one which can actualize the potential for other things to exist without having to have its own existence actualized by anything. 
What this entails is that this cause doesn't have any potential for existence that needs to be actualized in the first place. It just is actual, always and already actual as it were. Indeed, you might say that it doesn't merely have actuality the way things it actualizes does, but it just is pure actuality itself. So the causal principle that um, whenever, whenever a potency reduces to act, it requires some causal actualizer. That's the causal principle at play that um, both Phaser and Trent are drawing on, I believe. Uh, we're going to try to disambiguate this with two different readings. So here's the first reading. If there are a range of potentials, P1 through Pn, only one of which can be actualized at a given time, and one of them, P sub i, is actualized at that time, then there is some concurrently operative cause which makes P sub i actual at that time. So we're going to assume that CP is this causal principle for uh, developing now my problem of non sequiturs. So to say that a hierarchical chain of causal actualizations of substances potential for existence at a given time, T cannot descend infinitely, is to say that the first member of this chain is not caused to exist at T. Now let's call this first member alpha. Now there cannot be a range of potentials, only one of which can be actualized when it comes to the very existence of alpha at time t, since then alpha would require a cause of, A's, of alpha's existence at t, right? That's this first reading. But alpha's existence is not caused at t, because, you know, we're assuming that this is the first actualizer, or at least one first actualizer, among perhaps others. Hence, alpha has no potentials pertaining to its very substantial being or existence at t. Hence, the substantial being or existence of alpha at t is purely actual. It's devoid of a range of potentials, for example, parts of a that could constitute something else, or else potentials for alpha to cease to exist at t, or whatever. But to infer from this that alpha is purely actual full stop is a non sequitur. And it's a non sequitur for reasons similar to those canvassed in some of my other videos. And in this case, I said previous chapter because this is from my book manuscript. But it's highly germane here. Consider that 2, below, does not follow from 1, and that even if it did, 3 doesn't follow from 2. One, the substantial being or existence of alpha at t is purely actual. Two, the substantial being or existence of alpha is purely actual simpliciter. And three, not only is the substantial being or existence of alpha purely actual, but alpha is purely actual in all respects whatsoever. Now, for all phasers in Trent's arguments have shown, alpha's explanatory role is wholly indexed to time t. In order to be the uncaused terminus of the hierarchical chain of existential dependence at t, alpha need only be independent at t. And since alpha's having potentials pertaining to its substantial being or existence at t would entail, per the first reading of the causal principle that I gestured at earlier, that a is dependent at t, it follows that a is purely actual with respect to its substantial being or existence at t. But nothing follows about alpha's substantial being or existence at times other than t. There's simply nothing in the first reading of the causal principle, or in what Phaser or Trent says, uh, and particularly what Phaser says in the quoted passage above, that rules out alpha being the purely actual with respect to its substantial existence terminus of the hierarchical series at t, but some other thing, alpha star being the purely actual with respect to its substantial existence terminus of the hierarchical series at t plus 1. That's the next moment. And nothing in Phaser's proof rules out alpha having some potential pertaining to its substantial being or existence at t plus 1. In that case, A would not be purely actual with respect to its substantial existence simpliciter, and so 2 does not follow from 1 above. Now, you might object that alpha is timeless, and so it couldn't be that alpha is independent only at t, but this objection is confused, since whether alpha is timeless is the very thing needing to be shown here. It is, in other words, precisely the inference that is being challenged, or more accurately, it's one of the inferences being challenged. Think about it like this. What reason do we have to think alpha is timeless? Importantly, nothing said thus far in the Aristotelian proof gives us any reason to think alpha is timeless precisely because nothing in the proof rules out alpha as being merely independent at t and only t. Its explanatory role is indexed to t, and nothing in the proof disallows something else coming along and playing that explanatory role uh, at the next moment, which is itself such that its, its existence at that moment, its very substantial being at that moment, is purely actual at that moment and not dependent on another. But suppose that 2 did follow from 1, contrary to what I just argued. Even still, Phaser's inference to the pure actuality of alpha doesn't work. Now that's because 3 doesn't follow from 2. Even if alpha's substantial being or existence is purely actual simpliciter, it just doesn't follow that alpha is purely actual in all respects whatsoever. For there are potentials that are unrelated to the very substantial being or existence of their bearers, and alpha may very well have some such potentials. Consider, for instance, a necessarily actually existent fundamental particle, or a fundamental quantum field, or what have you. Now whether or not there are such things is beside the point. Now this particle has no potentials pertaining to its very being or existence, right? It's necessarily actually existent, and hence it has no potential to cease to exist or to be absent from reality or to vary or change in respect of its very being or existence. But it nevertheless has a whole host of potentials unrelated to its very sheer existence. For instance, it has the potential to occupy a different spatial location, 
Thus, even if 2 followed from 1 above, Phaser's inference would still be plagued by the non sequitur from 2 to 3. And again, guys, this isn't applying just to Phaser. I'm taking this from my book manuscript where I address Phaser's thing, but this same inf these same inferences are what uh, Trent needs under this first reading of the causal principle that Trent and Phaser employ. It's these same inferences that Trent needs to get to the purely actual status of this thing. I'm going to go over a second reading of the causal principle, but again, we're restricting our focus to the first reading right now. Now, what about the second reading of the causal principle? Now, the second reading is that whenever there is some transition from potential being to actual being, that is, whenever something that exists in potency is brought from its temporally or ontologically or causally prior state of existing in potency to its state of existing in actuality, there is an already actual cause of this transition. Now, once more, to say that a hierarchical chain of causal actualizations of substances, potentials for existence at a given time t cannot descend infinitely is to say that the first member of this chain is not caused to exist at t. And once more, call this first member alpha. Now, alpha does not transition from potential being to actual being with respect to its substantial existence at t, since then it would require a cause of that transition at t, per the second reading of the causal principle. Hence, alpha does not transition from potential being to actual being with respect to its substantial existence at t. But to infer from this that alpha is purely actual full stop is a non sequitur. Consider that 2 below does not follow from 1, 3 does not follow from 2, and 4 does not follow from 3. 1. Alpha does not transition from potential being to actual being with respect to its substantial existence at t. 2. Alpha cannot transition from potential being to actual being with respect to its substantial existence at t. That is, alpha has no potentials that could be reduced from potency to act in respect of its substantial existence at t, which is to say that alpha is purely actual with respect to its substantial existence at t. 3. The substantial being or existence of alpha is purely actual simpliciter, right? Not just at t. And finally, not only is the substantial being or existence of alpha purely actual, but alpha is purely actual in all respects whatsoever. That's what we need if we want to get to something that is purely actual in all respects whatsoever. Now, we've already seen why 4 does not follow from 3 and why 3 does not follow from 2. These are the same two non sequiturs outlined in the case of the first reading. And it doesn't seem difficult to see why 2 doesn't follow from 1, right? Merely from the fact that alpha does not in fact transition from potency to act in respect of its existence at t, and hence does not in fact require a cause, right? Merely from the fact that alpha does not in fact transition from potency to act in respect of its existence at t, nothing follows about whether alpha can or cannot so transition. There seems to be nothing incoherent in the conjunction of 1, alpha does not in fact transition from potency to act in respect of its existence at t, but 2, in some other possible world, alpha transitions from potency to act in respect of its existence at t. In such a scenario, alpha would lie outside the quantificational domain of the second reading, and hence could, for all the Aristotelian proof, plus the second reading shows, second reading of the causal principle, that is, shows it could be uncaused at t. Actually uncaused, but not necessarily uncaused. Now those then are the non sequitur worries I think afflict the Aristotelian proof, and in particular Trent's inference that I've been talking about from unactualized actualizer to purely actual actualizer. But perhaps the easiest, what, I mean what I take to be the most glaring or most significant non sequitur to see is the following. Suppose you're a theist who thinks that God is timeless, immutable, impassable, but nevertheless has some potential for cross-world variance, for example different intrinsic knowledge states, or numerically distinct timeless intentional acts, or whatever. Now, um, if you don't like this picture, say because you're a neoclassical theist, just substitute a temporal but necessarily existent god. All the same points will apply. Okay, so you then ask, why should I conclude, based on the Aristotelian proof, that God, as I conceive him, requires a sustaining cause? Now, Phaser's premise 7 and his Aristotelian proof, we don't need to worry about that now, but my point is just that Phaser's premise, as well as Trent's premises, are simply irrelevant to God so construed. Right? Remember, Trent's premise says that uh, when something is changing, then its, actual, then its potential for existence is actualized, concurrently causally actualized by something else. But that only applies to cases where we, ha where we have something that has some potential for existence. But God, so construed above, is necessarily actually existent. There is no such thing as God's potential for existence in this scenario above. Now, Phaser's premise 4, which is his causal principle, is likewise simply irrelevant to God so construed. For that premise only allows us to infer the need for a sustaining cause when there is indeed some kind of reduction from potency to act in respect of the existence of the thing in question. But in the case of God so construed, construed as above, there is no reduction from potency to act in respect of God's existence, precisely because God is necessarily actually existent and independent, right? God has no potential pertaining to his very being or existence, despite having various potencies for cross-world of variance in accidental properties on the aforementioned picture. 
And nothing in phasers or Trent's proof gives us any reason to think that God, so construed, couldn't be the unactualized actualizer. But in that case, nothing in the Aristotelian proof or Trent's Aristotelian proof, which is just Fraser's Aristotelian proof, justifies the inference to the unactualized actualizers being purely actual. This point generalizes to any necessarily existent but non-purely actual foundational being, whether it be theistic or non-theistic. Indeed, this is clearly true when we inspect the justifications proffered for the demand for a sustaining cause in Phaser's chapter. The justifications focus on water or other contingent substances, which are such that their constituents have the potential at any given time to exist as something else, or, as the case may be, to be absent from reality altogether. It is precisely for this reason that Phaser concludes that there must be some actualizing, sustaining, efficient cause that keeps such substances in being, after rejecting appeals to other things, and I've criticized his rejection here in various other places. There are whole swaths of inertialist-friendly explanations of something's existence at non-first moments of its existence uh, that don't adduce sustaining causes, but set that aside. We'll, we'll get to that later. Um, so yeah, we'll definitely get to that later. But my point is just that, right, the justifications that Phaser proffers on behalf of a sustaining cause, at least in his chapter, upon which Trent is rather clearly drawing, for those of you who are familiar with uh, Phaser's chapter and who have listened to Trent's opening statement, those justifications focus on contingent substances which are such that their constituents have the potential at any given time to exist as something else or to be absent from reality altogether. And it's precisely for that reason that the, the parts could exist as something else that there must be, according to Phaser, some actualizing, sustaining, efficient cause that keeps the substances, substances in being, that keeps those parts together. But of course, this justification is entirely irrelevant to the existence of God as construed earlier, right? God isn't some contingent substance, substance whose parts have the potential to be absent from reality altogether or have the potential to exist as something altogether separate, right? And thus, Phaser's own motivations for demanding a sustaining cause that simply fail to rule out the unactualized actualizer being non-purely actual. The same goes with Trent, and in that case, the proof fails. Now, Phaser, uh, he responds to this non-sequitur worry, uh, and he responds as follows. For why not suppose, instead, that it, that is alpha, has potentialities which are simply not in fact being actualized, at least not insofar as it is functioning as the first actualizer in some hierarchical series of causes? Perhaps these potentialities are actualized at some other time, when it is not so functioning, or perhaps they never are. To see what is wrong with this objection, recall once again that the regress of actualizers that we are ultimately concerned with is a regress of actualizers of the existence of things. The first actualizer in the series is first, then, in the sense that it can actualize the existence of other things without its own existence having to be actualized. So, suppose this first actualizer had some potentiality that had to be actualized in order for it to exist. What actualizes that potential? Should we suppose that it is something other than the first actualizer that actualizes it? But in that case, it's not really the first actualizer after all. But that's just mistaken. Look at the assumption Phaser is attempting to perform a reductio on. Suppose this first actualizer had some potentiality that had to be actualized in order for it to exist. Now, the natural reply here is, that is not the suggestion. The suggestion is not that the first actualizer has some potential that needs to be actualized in order for it to exist. The suggestion is precisely the opposite, that its existence has no such potentials. That is, that its very substantial being or existence has no potential whatsoever. It is a necessarily actual being. The suggestion instead is that there are potentials for accidental change, or potentials for cross-world variance in non-essential properties. And none of those need to be actualized in order for the being in question to exist. And so his reductio entirely misses the mark. And thus Phaser's rejoinder fails in averting the non-sequitur problem. And now we can apply Phaser's rejoinder to the two non-sequiturs under the first reading, and the three non-sequiturs. Actually, I could probably skip that, because I've already shown how it doesn't work. You're curious to see me go through these points. It's not that much. You can check the link in the description. Again, this document is available freely for everyone. By the way, if you like free philosophy and if you like the charity and care and caution and rigor uh, and intense research that goes into my videos and whatnot, uh, consider becoming a patron. And much love to all my existing patrons. Much, much love. Mwah! <laughs> Now, the question is, does Trent do something to bridge these gaps, right? The gap from unactualized actualizer to purely actual actualizer. Well, here's what he says. He says, this cause could not have any other potentialities, because like everything else we observe, what the cause does follows from what it is. And what it is, at its most basic level, is existence or actuality itself. To say this first actualizer has perfect existence, but another part of it doesn't exist, or exists only potentially, would be a contradiction. Now, uh, I just have what here? So, okay. Um, first, what is perfect existence? I mean, nowhere does Trent define it. Second, nowhere did Trent even justify how its existence is perfect. And third, Trent merely asserts that this would be a contradiction. How, how is this a contradiction? A, S has perfect existence. B, some part of S exists potentially. 
there's there's no contradiction there. I mean, maybe he means by perfect existence simply its existence, that is, its very substantial being, the sheer existence of the thing, is purely actual. Well, then we would at least come somewhat closer, maybe, to a contradiction, because then we have A star. S's very existence is purely actual, but B, some part of S, exists potentially. But once again, there is no contradiction at all here. In fact, I propose it is clearly not contradictory. For B says that some part of S exists potentially. In other words, S has some part or feature F only in potency. Now, since S is potentially F, it follows that F is an, is an accidental or non-essential feature of S, as is not F. So B says that S has some accidental feature. But now B is quite clearly compatible with A star. For something's accidental features are clearly different from S's very existence. Here's a proof for that. For any accidental feature F of S, by definition, S can exist without F. That's what it means for something to have an accidental or non-essential feature. It can exist without the thing, without the feature in question. But then S's very existence can be real without F itself being real, right? S can exist, and hence S's existence can be real, without S having F, and hence without F itself being there. Hence, S's very existence is different from F for any accidental feature F, because again, S can exist without a given accidental feature of it. But in that case, S's existence, being purely actual, is perfectly compatible with S's accidental feature, or features, not being purely actual, since the two are different, as I just showed with that proof above. We are not saying of some single X that it is both purely actual and has some potential. No, we're saying that S's very being or existence might be purely actual in the sense that, you know, S is a necessary being. It doesn't have any potentials to cease to exist or to come into existence or for its parts to compose something else. Instead, we're just saying that it has some accidental feature, right? And it's not going to be purely actual in that respect. And so we have purely actual in one respect, namely the very substantial being or existence or the sheer existence of the substance as such versus non-purely actual in a different respect, right? Not in respect of its very substantial being or existence or sheer actuality. And so there's no contradiction here. It's purely actual in one respect, not purely actual in another respect. There's no contradiction there. There is not some single X which is such that it's both purely actual and has some potential, and hence trend is simply wrong. There's no, there's no contradiction about up here. So... Now, uh, so that's my third response, right? So the first is he doesn't even define perfect existence. Second, he doesn't even justify how existence is perfect. Third, I've tried to I've tried to unpack what I think he might mean by it. Um, I've tried to make the best case I could for uh, uh, going from perfect existence and having that somehow be incompatible with some part of S existing potentially. Uh, that's that was the whole move of going from A star to B. So that's my third response. Now on to my fourth response. So Trent is here appealing to Phaser's move in which he appeals to Agade Sequitur Essay. I might be pronouncing that correctly. Please don't kill me. So uh, drawing, he's drawing rather clearly from Phaser's move. So I'm going to address Phaser's Agade Sequitur Essay move because he tries to bridge the gap from unactualized actualizer to purely actual actualizer using Agade Sequitur Essay. I've addressed this at length elsewhere in some of the resources that I linked above, uh, but uh, you know I'll just do it here as well. So Phaser responds to the charge that his inference to pure actuality is a non sequitur. His response is based on the principle agate sequitur essay, which basically says that attributes and activities of something cannot go beyond its nature, any more than an effect can go beyond its efficient cause, and hence a stone cannot exhibit attributes and activities like nutrition, growth, and reproduction, because these go beyond the nature of a stone. Now Phaser argues for this principle from the PSR. If an effect could go beyond its total cause, total efficient cause, that is, then, then the part of the effect that went beyond it would have no explanation and be unintelligible. Similarly, if a thing's activities could go beyond its nature, if, for example, a stone could take in nutrients or use language, then this activity would lack an explanation and be unintelligible. Now here's how Phaser applies Agatha's Secretor essay to infer the unactualized actualizer alpha cannot have potentiality. Might not we thus say that while it, that is alpha, had no potentialities with respect to its existence, it does have potentialities with respect to its activity? There are several problems with this suggestion, however, one of which might be obvious now that we have set out the principal agate sequitur essay, according to which what a thing does reflects what it is. If the first cause of things exists in a purely actual way, how could it act in a less than purely actual way? How could its acting involve potentiality any more than its existence does? If a thing's existence is, after all, what is metaphysically most fundamental about it? Excuse me, a thing's existence is, after all, what is metaphysically most fundamental about it. Everything else follows from that. So, from where in its nature are the metaphysically less fundamental potentialities for activity that the critic suggests it has supposed to derive? 
Now, there are at least nine reasons why this fails. So first, as we've seen, neither Phaser nor Trent has even established that alpha is purely actual with respect to its existence simpliciter, right? Um, <laughs> under Depending on which reading we were talking about, uh, it was only able to get to something that was in fact unactualized, but not that it's unactualizable in principle in respect of its existence. Or depending on the other causal principle, we were only able to get something that is um, unactualizable at a particular time and nothing follows merely from that, whether or not it's unactualizable at any other particular time. And so uh, we haven't even, <laughs> Phaser and Trend haven't even established that alpha is purely actual with respect to its existence simpliciter. And hence we cannot infer that alpha acts in a purely actual way simpliciter, since it is not even established that alpha exists in a purely actual way simpliciter. So that's the first problem. Second problem, the argument is incapable of establishing that alpha is purely actual, even assuming, one, Alpha is purely actual with respect to its existence simpliciter, and two, alpha's being purely actual with respect to its existence simpliciter entails that alpha acts in a purely actual manner. For there are potencies that are unrelated both to the existence and actions of the substance to which they belong. In other words, even if Phaser could establish one and two here, he still has not established that alpha is purely actual simpliciter. Consider, for instance, potencies to be affected in such and such ways, unrelated to, the substan unrelated to substantial change or alpha's actions. Now, Phaser might retort, of course, that this would comp compromise Alpha's role as the terminus of the per se chain of actualizations of potentials for existence, but that's simply not so. Ex hypothesi, Alpha is being or could be affected in manners wholly unrelated to its existence and its role as an existential actualizer that is unactualized in respect of its very existence. Phaser's argument here is therefore unable to establish Alpha's pure actuality simpliciter. Third, this is the third problem, as Phaser himself points out, a thing can, in a sense, go beyond its nature if something makes it do so. For example, the bits of wood that make up a puppet can move when the puppeteer makes them do so, even though they cannot move on their own. So, assuming arguendo that alpha exists in a purely actual way, alpha could easily behave in ways that involve actualizations of potency so long as something makes alpha do so. And importantly, such behaviors need not relate to the very existence of alpha, and hence there being potentials in alpha relating to such behaviors is perfectly compatible with alpha's being purely actual with respect to its existence. Now, Phaser might retort that this is impossible because being caused to behave is the actualization, actualization of the potential and alpha is purely actual, but that's clearly question begging since whether alpha is purely actual full stop is precisely the question at issue. Fourth, Phaser equivocates on the principle agere sequitur esse. He first explicates it as something like it is impossible for S of itself to perform action A if A is beyond or at variance with S's nature. He then switches this understanding to something like how a thing acts reflects what it is. But what the hell does reflect mean? <laughs> and nowhere does Phaser define it in any of his works. And more importantly, why should we accept this second understanding of the principle? And the second understanding by no means follows from the first. The second reading, avoiding the vagueness of reflex, seems more precisely formulated as if S exists F-wise, that is, in an F-way or manner, then S acts F-wise. This second reading, or something very much like it, is what Phaser needs if he wants to infer from the fact that, Al that A exists, that should probably be alpha, that alpha exists in a purely actual way, that alpha acts in a purely actual way. But the first understanding neither means nor entails the second understanding, and the considerations adduced in favor of the first understanding, for example the PSR, do not support the second. From the fact that nothing can act so as to contravene its nature, it simply doesn't follow that if S exists F-wise, then S acts F-wise. The fifth problem with this appeal to Agade Sequitur essay, which again, uh, what I'm saying here applies pretty much mutatis mutandis. I don't know if I pronounce that right. Mutatis mutandis. Mutatis mutandis. It's a me, a Mario. It's a me, a Cameron Bertuzzi. It's a me, a Cameron Bertuzzi. <laughs> Mario, Luigi, want some pizza? Pizzeria. Okay, I I'm just having a bit of fun. Don't call me like racist towards Italians or something. Like, come on, come on, come on, dude. I, I, I've... anyway. <laughs> So, okay, so here's the fifth problem. Notice that the principle under the first understanding only states that a thing cannot do what its essence or nature precludes it from doing. Even granting phases that alpha is purely actual in respect of its existence, we don't thereby know anything about its essence that precludes it from having existence unrelated potentials. Again, an existence unrelated potential is just a potential that is not a potential for the substance to exist or to begin to exist or cease to exist or fail to exist or whatever. For example, the potential for a dog to bark is unrelated to the very sheer existence or substantial being of the dog, whereas the potential to die does so relate. Okay, so um, where was I? I just looked at the footnote 4, which is coming up to here. So where is footnote 4? Man. So again, this is, this is a fifth problem. So the principle only states that a thing cannot do what its essence or nature precludes it from doing. But even if we grant that alpha is purely actual in respect of its existence, we don't thereby know anything about its essence that precludes it from having existence unrelated potentials. Indeed, we have already seen how this could work with changeable necessary beings. Such beings exist in a purely actual way, because they're absolutely necessary, 
necessarily actually existent, but they clearly can still have existence unrelated potentials, such as accidental features, as well as potencies for action. Or even if they're unchangeable, they might have unchangeable, they might still have potentials for cross-world variants in their accidental features. That's the fifth problem. Sixth problem. There are clear counterexamples to the second understanding of the principle, the one that seems required for Phaser's argument to go through. Suppose that it, right, because Phaser's trying to go from S exists in a purely actual way to S acts in a purely actual way. That's the inference that he's trying to get at. So he needs something like if S exists F wise, that is in an F way or manner, then S acts F wise or in an F way or manner. But there are clear counterexamples to this. Suppose that it's true. Well, importantly, God exists in a necessary way, and hence it follows that God must act in a necessary way. But then God is unable to do contingent things, such as freely creating and sustaining the universe. Moreover, since nothing exists in a way that's under its own control, right? <laughs> something like me, I would already have to exist in order to exert such control. This principle would entail absurdly that nothing acts in a way that is under its own control, right? I act in a way that's under my own control. My existence is not under my own control. And hence it's false that if something exists F-wise, then it acts F-wise because I don't exist in a way that is under my control. But nevertheless, I act in a way that is under my control. So my existence is F-wise, namely not in my control, but my activities are not FYs. It's not the case that they're not under my control. They are in my control. So here's a seventh problem with it. An absurd form of occasionalism, or else something relevantly like it, seems to follow from that principle. According to Phaser, and according to Trent's own argument, any non-God substance S has no ability of itself to exist, right? And so the manner of S's existence is hence wholly derivative from an extrinsic cause. S is a mere instrument in respect of its existence. But if S exists merely instrumentally, then according to the principle, S can only act instrumentally. Just as S's existence is wholly instrumental to God's bestowal of existence, S can only act in a wholly instrumental manner. Nothing other than God truly acts of itself. But every non-God thing purely derives its quote-unquote actions in a wholly instrumental manner. But that seems to be an absurd form of occasionalism, or at least something that seems relevantly similar to it so as to be a problematic diminishment of creaturely causality. It is simply false that the only causes in the created order are mere instrumental causes of the creator, whose activities derive wholly from God working, uh, God using them as mere instruments, like a paintbrush. Right? Things have real, genuine causal power of themselves. Right? Was Hitler a mere instrument, all of whose causal powers, and indeed all of whose exercises of causal powers, are purely derivative from God, such that Hitler was merely an instrument by means of which and through which God brought about the Holocaust? No, no, it's not. So here's the eighth problem. One of Phaser's explications of the principle is that what a thing does reflects what it is. I have that for sake of simplicity. It shows you that there's kind of like one concept here. What a thing does reflects what it is. In order to infer from such a principle anything about what alpha does, we would therefore need to know what alpha is. But even if Phaser has shown that, what al that alpha exists in a purely actual manner, by itself that says little to nothing about what alpha is. It only tells us something about the manner of alpha's existence, but nothing about the full breadth and depth of what alpha is. And we cannot, in a non-question-begging manner, assume that facts concerning alpha's existence exhaust facts concerning alpha, since that is precisely the question at issue, right? Namely, whether there are or can be potential features of alpha despite alpha's being purely actual with respect to its existence. Indeed, Phaser seems to subtly beg the question here. One can only apply Agade Sequitur essay to alpha once one has established what alpha is. But what alpha is, is the very question at issue. Namely, like, whether or not it is by nature, what it is, is a purely actual being, right? And hence, one cannot assume that what alpha is, is a purely actual in order to infer that how alpha acts is purely actual. Ninth, Phaser's point, so this is the ninth and final problem, uh, Phaser's point concerning the fundamentality of, of existence is wrong-headed. He, Phaser points out that existence is the most fundamental fact concerning a thing, but in order to validly infer from the conjunctive proposition existence is the most fundamental, f existence is most fundamental to anything and alpha is purely actual with respect to its existence, that any less fundamental aspects of alpha, like alpha's actions, must therefore be purely actual, Phaser requires something like the following principle. If on one metaphysical level x lacks f, then x also lacks f at less fundamental metaphysical levels. Not only does Phaser give no justification for such a principle, but it also seems straightforwardly false. Presumably, physical facts about humans are more fundamental than psychological or at least biological facts about humans. But the physical facts by themselves, like, you know, the, the spin and charge of particles and, and their color and their flavor, those are actually, um, those are actually part properties of, of subatomic particles. But anyway, nothing about those physical facts by themselves, those physical facts lack features such as language comprehension and imagination or digestion, whereas such features are present in less fundamental facts about humans, like human psychological facts or at least human biological facts. And so for these nine reasons, the appeal to Agate Sequitur essay just fails.
Now, Trent attempts to justify premise nine that if something is pure act, it would be God. So, so again, I just went through, well, just went through a lot of stuff, but um, basically, Trent's inference to the pure actuality of the unactualized actualizer has many non sequiturs, and he tried to bridge it with uh, Agate's sequitur essay, but that didn't work. So now we are moving on to his justification of premise nine. Uh, so if something is pure act, it would be God. Well, I'll tackle his inferences of the divine attributes. I've addressed these elsewhere too. See my phaser on Schmidt on the Aristotelian proof. So Trent says, there can only be one purely actual actualizer. If there were more than one in order to distinguish them, each actualizer would lack something the other had, but then each would have potentials which they can't have if they're purely actual. Now this fails, as I point out elsewhere. Um, right, again, he's drawing on He's, he's drawing rather explicitly on what Phaser says in his chapter. Phaser's argument for the uniqueness of a purely actual being is as follows. For there to be two or more purely actual beings, a differentiating feature must obtain between them. But, writes Phaser, there could be such a differentiating feature only if a purely actual actualizer had some unactualized potential, which, being purely actual, it does not have. But this just fails. A differentiating feature could easily be had in terms of some difference in actual features between or among things. An elephant, an amoeba, and a planet, for instance, are distinguished by many features other than unrealized potentials. Yes, they're also distinguished by different potentials, too, but that's perfectly compatible with my claim. And while having different actual features entails that one being does not have the feature the other has, the mere absence of a feature does not entail potentially having that feature. For example, I don't have the feature being made entirely of gold, but I'm not even potentially made entirely of gold. Blang blang! Moreover, this line of argument, if successful, is inconsistent with Trinitarian conceptions of God, according to which there is one God in three divine persons. For in order for there to be more than one divine person, there would have to be some feature that one had that the others lacked. Right? That's precisely what this, <laughs> this is saying. In order for there to be more than one thing, uh, more than one purely actual thing, say, there would have to be some feature in virtue of which they're distinguished. Uh, the reason for that is because, well, if there weren't some feature in virtue of which they're distinguished, well, then their being distinct would be inexplicable, right? There'd be nothing to ground or account for it. But that is a perfectly general line of argument. You can apply it equally to different divine persons. And so, in order for there to be more than one divine person, there would have to be some feature that one had that the others lacked. And in that case, according to Phaedrus and Trent's own reasoning, at least one of the divine persons must have some unactualized potential. But that that runs into rather obvious trouble on two fronts. First, it's incompatible with such a person being divine, right? God is by nature purely actual, and hence anything with the divine nature, including a divine person, would also be purely actual. Hence, if one such divine person has an unactualized potential, it wouldn't be divine after all. Second, if one divine person has unactualized potential, then there exists unactualized potential within God, since each divine person is intrinsic to God, and that's obviously incompatible with God's being purely actual. Now, Phaser does offer a distinct but related justification elsewhere. He says two or more things of a kind are to be differentiated in terms of some perfection or privation that one has that the other lacks. But what is purely actual is completely devoid of any privation and is maximal imperfection. Hence, there can be, hence there can be no way, in principle, to differentiate one purely actual cause from another. There are tons of problems with this argument. So first, we've been given no reason to think that the only two types of differentiating features are privations or perfections. In general, there is a distinction between not possessing a perfection and having a privation, right? Having, a, having wings is a perfection for an eagle, but not for a worm. Not possessing a feature is only a defect or a lack or a privation if possessing that feature is in some sense characteristic of or proper to one's kind. So if one purely actual being, A1, has a perfection that the other A2 does not have, this neither means nor entails that, L, that A2 lacks something in the sense of a defect. And nor does it entail that A2 potentially has that feature. A2 could simply, necessarily, and essentially not have it. And so it doesn't even have the potential to have it. Now one might object that act and potency divide reality exhaustively. So if we have two purely actual beings, A1 and A2, and A2 has a perfection X that A1 lacks, well then either X is an act or a potency. But it can't be a potency since we're talking about purely actual beings. But it can't be an act either, for if it were, then since A2 has X, it follows that purely actual beings can have X. And so A1, being a, pu being a purely actual being, lacks a perfection it can have, thus entailing a defect or an imperfection. And so there is potency in A1. But X hypothesi, A1 is purely actual. Now, the problem with this argument is that from the facts that 1, A1, is, A1 has X, and 2, A1 is purely actual, it does not follow that 3, for any other purely actual being A2, A2 can also have X. For one thing, there are obvious counterexamples. Take, for instance, the property being identical to A1. Conditions 1 and 2, but not 3, are satisfied here. That's, how, that's like saying, since, since I have the property of being identical to me, right, it follows that human beings can have the property, and since I'm a human being, right, it follows that human beings can have the property of being identical to me, and hence you, who are a human being, can have the property of being identical to me. No, that's BS. I was going to curse, but I want to keep this PG. I say some other things here about uh, an argument someone put to me about purely actual beings forming a kind and whatnot, uh, and I address that in this document, so check that out if you're interested, but we're moving on. Moving right along, to quote 
uh, Cameron Vertuzzi. <laughs> okay, so Trent says, also, if there were more than one purely actual being, they would have to exist in a common framework that's more fundamental than them, and so neither could be pure actuality. So first, that's just a bold assertion. Why, why would they have to exist in a common framework that's more fundamental than them? Why would they need to exist in a common framework at all? What even is a framework? What's a framework? Uh, I mean, if they do have to exist in a framework, why couldn't it be equally as fundamental as them? That's the first problem. It's just a bold assertion. And that which is asserted without evidence is likewise dismissed without evidence. And yes, I just asserted that without evidence. I'm just, I'm messing with you guys. Anyway, there are some inside jokes here, but <laughs> sorry, I shouldn't be doing that. Second, okay, we're moving on. Second, there's a parody argument that disproves Trinitarianism. So this is kind of where the, the well, this is one aspect of where the, thumb, the, the title is coming in, right? Has Trent Horn disproved Christianity? Um, right? Imagine that we argued as follows. Also, if there were more than one purely actual divine person, they would have to exist in a common framework. That's more fundamental than them. And so they could not be pure actuality, and hence they wouldn't even be divine after all under classical theism. So that's yet another problem for this what Trent, what Trent says here. So Trent's inference to uniqueness fails, his two, his two inferences, his two attempted inferences. So he also tries to infer timelessness as follows. The purely actual being cannot change, but time is the measure of change and, hence, and uh, is, a, is a measure of change, and hence the cause cannot be subject to time. That doesn't work, as I've explained at length elsewhere. First, it was just asserted that time is a measure of, of change, right? Uh, and that, I mean, again, this is just not presented with any justification. Again, I, I recognize that Trent He's limited on time, but uh, I would say then try not to have as many arguments in your opening statement and rather try to flesh out the ones that you do have so you can actually properly justify the key steps that are needed. But anyway, uh, that's just me, and that's how a play has got to be. There are lots of other problems for this view of time as a measure of change, but anyway, we're, we're going to move on. I'll talk about those later. So anyway, here is I'm going to try to steel man Trent's case here. Um, so... Premise one, time is a measure of change. Premise two, if time is a measure of change, then anything temporal is subject to change. Premise three, no purely actual being is subject to change. That's kind of definitionally true if change is the actualization of potential, which Trent didn't justify, but I guess I'll grant here. Uh, four, so no purely actual thing is temporal, so anything purely actual is non-temporal or timeless. <clears throat> so there are several reasons why this argument is unsuccessful. Uh, no, those footnotes don't matter. Well, they do, but you can check those out uh, on your own time. So anyway, this argument fails. First, it's not clear what time as a measure of change means, right? There are countless different ways to measure change, many of which are entirely tangential to time. One can measure the quantity of changes that occur, their magnitude, their spatial extent, their quality, their probability, and so on. And those are entirely irrelevant to time. In order to avoid that, it seems you must specify that time as a measure of change quasi temporal dimension, or temporal extent, or temporal succession. But, and then you just have, then you're just specifying that the measure is one of temporal duration. And then your analysis is circular, right? Time is the measure of change, but by that you have to slip in, oh yeah, but by the way, the way that we're measuring it is one of temporal duration, and so you've just given a, a circular analysis. Second, even if we grant this account of time, the original argument still fails. Consider, again, the original argument's second premise. If time is the measure of change, then anything temporal is subject to change. But that consequent just doesn't follow from the antecedent. That's a non sequitur. For, plausibly, the antecedent le the antecedently. The antecedent only says that the existence of time entails that there is some change or other. It does not say that everything that exists in time must be such that it intrinsically changes. For all the argument shows, temporal reality could be such that 1. Objects O1 through O n exist in time, 2. One of the aforementioned O sub i is intrinsically unchangeable, and 3. Time nevertheless exists and passes in virtue of changes in objects other than O sub i, and to which we can suppose O sub i relationally stands. So the argument fails for these two reasons. Uh, there are other reasons as well, but I'm, we need to move on. So Trent tries to infer immateriality. He says, quote, we also know that matter is always changing, end quote. Now that's just a bold assertion, uh, a common theme. Yes, many material things change, but is it essential to the nature of materiality? Trent, in his debate, was rather adamant on accusing Ben of committing the fallacy of accident quite often. But then he goes around and says, oh, yeah, well, uh, material things, yeah, the, that's always changing. How do you know that's not the, the, the fallacy of accident? Maybe, uh, yeah, it's a very common feature of matter that it's changing. But why think that's a very, that's part, constitutive of the very nature or essence of matter as such? We need some independent reason, and just asserting it isn't giving us an independent reason. And again, he seems to be drawing on Phaser here. Phaser writes, since to be material entails being changeable and existing within time, an immutable and eternal cause must be immaterial and thus incorporeal or without any sort of body, unquote. Now, nowhere does Phaser or Trent justify why being material entails being changeable and existing within time. Perhaps they take it to be self-evident, but it's by no means self-evident. Consider a temporal wave function monism. 
That is a popular view in philosophy of physics on which there exists a fundamental physical non-spatiotemporal entity. That's a perfectly respectable view that has seen a blossoming of interest in philosophy of physics. I give a number of different citations here. There are even boatloads more citations. Alyssa Ney, she has done work on it. She published a 2021 book with Oxford University Press uh, entitled, I think, oh man, I'm kind of forgetting, The Metaphysics of the Wave Function or something like that. Um, Man, I, I probably should remember. But anyway, there are lots of philosophers of physics and metaphysicians who are working on these sorts of views where uh, there's some fundamental physical object which is such that it is a non-spatiotemporal, atemporal, well, non-spatiotemporal, atemporal. Nice one, Joe. It's not a non-spatiotemporal wave function, universal wave function. If we understand material and physical to be synonymous, then it simply follows that there are perfectly respectable views on which there is an unchangeable, timeless, material thing. Unless and until Phaser and Trent demonstrate that such views are false, their inference of the immateriality of the unchangeable that is purely actual being simply fail. Trent says, the cause must also be unlimited because a limit would entail a potential. That's a bold assertion. Firstly, why would a limit entail potential? Um, as far as I can tell, he doesn't give any reason for that. So, secondly, uh, limitation doesn't entail potential. <laughs> Consider that the number two is limited in all sorts of ways, right? It's limited in being even and not odd, right? It doesn't get to be odd, uh, unfortunately. Um, it just has to be even. Um, it's limited in the its quantity in some sense, right? It's not three, it's not four, it's not five, it's not infinity, right? Anyway, it's not unlimited in the sense in which God is unlimited. It, it doesn't have knowledge, say. It doesn't have good-making properties. So the number two is limited in, in a whole panoply of ways. A whole concoction of ways. It's so limited. Uh, but... It has no potential to be different, right? It has all of its properties, essentially. It's not like the number two could exist today, but not tomorrow. And it's not like it has the potential to put on a dress, or to smile, or to change the number three, or to change from being even to odd, or to change its status as the successor of one. Indeed, even in the realm of concrete... So, so we just have a straightforward counterexample here. The two is limited, but it doesn't have potential. So limitation doesn't entail potential. But uh, even in the realm of concrete, a limitation doesn't entail potentiality. There is such a thing as essential limits, right? Limits that something couldn't possibly take on another value for, right? The purely actual thing could be limited in whole swaths of ways, so long as they are all necessarily and essentially possessed limits. For then, there is no potential to have different limits, or to increase or decrease, or whatever. They're necessarily and essentially had by the things in question. And so, purely actual being doesn't need to be unlimited. Trent then relies on the inference uh, to unlimited to get to all powerful, but the inference to unlimited fails, as I just argued, and hence so does the inference to all powerful. Trent then argues that the cause must be a concrete object. He then, well, yeah, that that's certainly right. If by concrete we mean that it has causal power, so he's certainly right there. He then says it's immaterial, but as I've showed, his inference to immateriality fails. He then says the only immaterial causal realities we know of are the intentions of an agent, and so the cause must be personal. So I take it that the ar the argument is something like premise one: the cause is is um, a causal, concrete, immaterial object. The only immaterial, causal, concrete, immaterial objects we know of are intentional agents, so the cause is an intentional agent. So, for starters, this argument is invalid. Um, okay, fine, maybe he wants to make it a non-deductive argument. Uh, I'm still going to question the inference from <laughs> the only things that we know of that satisfy uh, this, this description are x to, oh yeah, by the way, it is in fact x. No, maybe it's something that we don't know of. We're talking about the ultimate nature of reality. Why would we expect us to be able to why would we expect us to be able to uh, abstract from our common experience of things which are mental and so on to be able to infer that the ultimate nature of reality likewise shares those features? We need some independent reason to think that, and Trent doesn't give that. He just gives us this argument, basically. So anyway, it just doesn't follow from the fact that the only immaterial, causal, concrete objects that we know of are intentional agents, that it must thereby be an intentional agent. That's the first problem. Second, it assumes that there are immaterial, causal, concrete objects. Right? He's saying that we do, in fact, know of these sorts of things. I mean, maybe he might be able to cast this argument in a way that doesn't do that. But Well, no, because he's, he's trying to say, oh, well, we actually do know of these things, and because that's the only candidates that we know of, it, it must fit that description, or at least it probably fits that description. So, okay, yeah, um, I, I do think that he assumes that there are immaterial, causal, concrete objects. But few philosophers of mind would be on board with this. Now, that's not an objection to what he says, right? I'm just flagging this, because when it's spoken so confidently in a debate, audiences might fail to realize that some extremely unpopular and roundly criticized views in other domains of philosophy are simply presupposed, without any argument and without any acknowledgement, that they are severe minority views. Also, it's this is a third problem now. The argument here is subject to parody. Uh, 
Premise one, the cause is a causal concrete immaterial object. Premise two, the only causal concrete immaterial objects we know of are changeable beings. <laughs> That's true, right? Look around us. The only causal concrete immaterial objects, perf uh, Trent's own lights, are minds that are around us. But the minds that we know around us are all changeable. So what follows from that is it, the cause is changeable. But if it's changeable, then it's not purely actual, and hence it's not purely actual. And so it seems as though Trent's argument has disproved his own position. The justification for premise two is identical in both cases, right? And the inference from one and two to three is exactly the same. And so arguably Trent has disproved classical theism. Okay, so now moving on to my direct critical appraisal. So all of that there, that was just me addressing Trent's justification for his arguments, okay? <laughs> now we're going on, so I, I don't, I think it's roundly, it's thoroughly unjustified, as I've argued. But now let's go on to my critical appraisal of the argument. So now I'm going to be leveling independent objections that don't target Trent's justification. Uh, or I was just targeting Trent's justification above. Now we're going on to the critical appraisal of it, okay? All right, so premise two says that change involves the actualization of a potential, right? So you sort of have the capitalist uh, sort of... Um, it, it's a sort of proletariat revolution that's going to overtake the bourgeoisie, right? And it, they sort of seize the means of production. Okay. Um, anyway, premise two, change involves the actualization of potential. I just spit all over my computer, by the way. I need to go and wash this off. I'll be back. Okay. Uh, I just cleaned myself. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, unjustified. So, changes the actualization potential. This is unjustified. You can see my response to Fraser's argument for the act potency distinction here. Click here. It presupposes ontological pluralism. This is the second problem with it, which we should reject. You can see my discussion with Dr. Trenton Merricks here, where we um, go over Trent's paper published in Noose, which is like tied for mind as the best philosophy journal in the world, where he argues against ontological pluralism. And arguably, this disproves classical theism, right? It requires a dynamic view of time. If change involves the actualization potential, well, suppose that a static or eternalist view of time uh, where everything just tenselessly actually exists in an equal ontological status, well then it's false that change involves the actualization of potential because there's change over time. And no one, no one denies that, right? There's change over time. I've gone from, you know, not making this video to making this video and doing certain Zizek impressions and whatnot. So there's obviously change over time, but under eternalism and static views of time, um, that change over time cannot be analyzed in terms of an actualization of potential because it's not as though there was some state of potential being that went from potential being to actual being. No, everything is equally actually existent. Change instead, as people in literature recognize under such views, would it simply have to be variance in the actual properties of something along their temporal dim dimension. So in order for change to be the actualization of potential, we need to have a dynamic view of time. But that entails that God changes in his knowledge and hence is actualized by something else per premise five, right? Whatever changes per premise five requires some kind of extrinsic cause. But God isn't actualized by anything else under classical theism, and hence classical theism is false. So Trent's argument, if successful, disproves classical theism. So briefly, I'll try to spell out why this changing knowledge thing is a problem. Um, again, I've addressed this ad nauseum elsewhere, so I'm not going to be super in depth here. So you're just going to have to forgive me, but I want to give, I want to just want to put this on your radar. So briefly, premise one, there is change. Now this, I claim, is manifest and evident to the senses. Premise two, if there is change, then some things go from being true to being false, or vice versa, right? If there's change, for example, water is going from a liquid state to a solid state, then the proposition or sentence, the water is liquid, goes from being true to being false. And the proposition or sentence, the water is solid, goes from being false to being true. Premise three, if some things go from being true to being false, then God goes from knowing them to not knowing them. Now this follows from the factivity of knowledge, right? Knowledge is factive. In other words, one can only know that P is true if P is in fact true. It cannot be the case that one knows P, but P is false. For example, it's true that 1 plus 1 equals 2, and so it makes no sense to say, I know 1 plus 1 isn't 2. Moreover, it's true that Trent, Trent Horn is based and awesome and amazing, and so it makes no sense to say that I know that he isn't based, that he isn't awesome, that he isn't amazing, right? This entails that if P genuinely goes from being true to being false, then it can't remain the case that one knows P. For if it remained the case that one knows P, well then since knowing P presupposes P's truth, it would follow that P itself remained true. But ex hypothesi, P went from being true to being false and hence didn't remain true. And thus, if some things go from being true to being false, then God goes from knowing them to not knowing them. And in the case at hand, God would go from knowing P to knowing the negation of P, as he's omniscient, right? I'm, not, I'm obviously not saying that there are truths that God doesn't know. Okay, premise four, if God goes from knowing them to not knowing them, then there is succession in God's life, and moreover, God has potential to acquire knowledge. Now, now, this is surely just what succession means, to go from one thing to another. And it's also just what potential means. God has the potential here to acquire knowledge that he did not already possess. Premise five, if there is succession in God's life, and moreover, if God has potential to acquire knowledge, then God is temporal, in which case classical theism is false. That's part and parcel of temporality, and thing whose life involves succession enjoys a before and after, and hence temporality. Premise six, so classical theism is false. I've addressed objections to this at length elsewhere.
For instance, you can see my video with Ryan Mullins on classical theism and extrinsic change. And I've also addressed objections on my blog. So, yeah, anyway, premise four, any change is caused by something actual. Interestingly, I'm going to argue that this is actually incompatible with Trent's premise five, which demands a sustaining cause of changing beings. And so the argument he levels is self-defeating. In other words, I'm going to argue that his premise here, any change is caused by something actual, actually entails existential inertia, which defeats his premise 5, which requires denying existential inertia. So his proof is, in essence, self-defeating. Now, existential inertia thesis is variously characterized, and uh, I'm just going to give one that's a common denominator. So it's basically the claim that at least some temporal concrete objects persist in the absence of both one, substance or cons conservation from without, and two, sufficiently destructive factors that would destroy the object or objects. Importantly, existential inertia does not aim to answer that in virtue of which objects persist. Instead, it merely purports to describe the way that they persist. EIT can and should be supplemented with an answer to the aforementioned questions, and I'll get to some of those answers later. Uh, and they, those represent inertialist friendly metaphysical accounts of persistence, that is, explanations of persistence that are friendly to existential inertia that are compatible with it. Um, okay, so existential inertia, this is just um, a formalized way of talking about what I'm getting at, but basically, uh, temporal concrete objects, or some subset thereof, persist in existence without being continuously sustained by something that isn't a part of them. That is, without being continuously sustained or conserved in being from something wholly outside of or disjoint from them. And, of course, in the absence of sufficiently destructive factors, whether internal or external. So that's the basics of the thesis. You can uh, read this if you want, um, my more precise characterization here, but uh, I'm going to move on. So here's the problem. According to the Aristotelian proof's causal principle, captured in premise 4 of Phaser's proof, and I think, what, what did I say, was it premise 5? No, pre it's actually premise 4 of uh, Trent's proof as well. So according to the proof's causal principle, captured in premise 4, no potential can be actualized unless something already actual causally actualizes it. Suppose object O exists at time t. Now, for O to go out of existence at some arbitrary t prime, such that t prime is later than t, is for a change to occur, right? It's for O's potential to cease to exist to become actual. But since a potential can only become actual if something already actual causally actualizes it, it follows that O could only go out of existence at t prime if something already actual causally actualizes this. So, if nothing already actual causally actualizes O's going out of existence at t prime, O will not go out of existence at t prime. But remember that t prime represents any arbitrary time later than t. Hence, if nothing already causally, hence if nothing already actual causally actualizes O's going out of existence from, this is, okay, so this is interval notation. I recognize that some of you guys might not be fully familiar with this. Interval notation. This is an interval of time. We have t, which is one time, t prime, which is another time. t prime greater than t, that means t prime is later than t, okay? Interval. This is an interval of time, okay? So it's going from one time to another. It's, you know, we're just talking about that interval. Now, a closed bracket, that means that it includes that time. So if I had a closed bracket with noon, and then a closed bracket over here at 1, that would be all the times between 12 and 1, including 12 and 1. But if it were an open bracket here, that means that this, the, the one on the right here is not included in the interval. But everything that, that up, and, up until that point would be included. So for instance, if this were 12 and this were 1 o'clock, well then, 12 would be included, right? But 1 o'clock would not be included, but everything up to 1 would be included, right? So like 12.59.59 and 12.59.59.9999999995 and point nine nine you know, all the way up. So anyway, that's interval notation. Uh, that's a little crash course. Crash courses with Joe. Okay, um, hence if nothing already actual causally actualizes O is going out of existence from T to T prime, for any T prime greater than T, less later than T that is, O will not go out of existence from that interval, right? Hence, if nothing already actual causally actualizes O's going out of existence from t to t prime, O will persist from t to t prime. But, and here's the crucial thing, absences are not actual things. They're precisely the absence or non-existence of actual things. In a fortiori, an absence of sustenance or conservation from without is not an actual thing. Hence, an absence of sustenance from without cannot causally actualize O's going out of existence at t prime precisely because only something already actual can causally actualize potentials, per the causal principle, whereas absences are not actual. Thus, if no positive reality, which is just something that isn't an absence, if no positive reality causally destroys O from t to t prime for any t prime later than t, O will persist from t to t prime. But that's just to say that existential inertia is true. According to existential inertia, temporal objects persist without external sustenance so long as they aren't positively destroyed. We already saw that the mere absence of sustenance couldn't be an already actual cause of O's cessation at any time t prime later than t. 
Thus, so long as no positive reality comes along and positively destroys O, O will persist to T prime, even in the absence of sustenance from without. And so CP seems the causal principle here that, that Trent himself is adducing seems straightforwardly to entail existential inertia. But crucially, existential inertia straightforwardly undercuts both Trent's and the Aristotelian proof's demand for external sustenance of O as a necessary condition of O's existence even for a moment. This demand for a sustaining cause of act-potency composite objects is captured in Phaser's premise 7 and Trent's premise 5. According to that premise, a changing, or changeable, depending on how you look at it, a changing substance, S, cannot exist for a moment, but for the conserving power of some sustaining cause. But this clearly contravenes existential inertia, which, as we've seen, is entailed by the causal principle. This, then, is the problem, <laughs> the fundamental problem that I'm leveling here for the Aristotelian proof and for Trent's argument from change. The proof's causal principle entails EIT, existential inertia thesis, which in turn defeats the proof's seventh premise. Now, I consider many objections in this document, and I highly, highly recommend you guys to check out my responses. I get extremely in-depth here, and if you think of a response, I have probably addressed it in here. I'm not saying that I've certainly addressed it, but I have probably addressed it in here. I've run this argument by a number of people and have come up with a number of objections to it on my own as well. Uh, and it, it's also been through a, a peer review process, and one of the referees was very happy about the paper, but the other one wasn't as happy about the paper. Uh, but that referee brought up some objections that I address in here, and I think that they aren't... <laughs> anyway, uh, I think that they aren't good. But um, So anyway, I highly advise you guys to check out the objections here, but I'm not going to go through all of them. They're extremely in-depth, they're somewhat technical, but if you have an objection to this, don't furiously type it without going to the document and actually reading the objections that I consider, okay? I consider like five or so, um, but yeah. Uh, anyway, we're going to move on. So my point is just that um, Trent's argument here is self-defeating because this causal principle entails existential inertia. And again, see this document in the description and look at all those uh, objections that I consider and my responses to them in particular. All right, so now let's go on to premise five. There are many problems with this premise as well. It says anything that is changing has its potential for existence actualized by something else. My criticism here is that there is no such thing as a potential for existence, and hence this premise is false. It assumes that there is such a thing as a potential for existence, but there's no such thing. Okay, so to begin spelling this out, um, first I'll note that the causal principle might be ambiguous between two readings. First, if there are a range of potentials p1 through pn, only one of which can be actualized at a given time t, and one of them is actualized at t, then there is some concurrently operative cause which makes it actual at t. A second reading is whenever there is some transition from potential being to actual being, that is whenever something exists in a state of potency and is brought from that state, that temporally or ontologically ca or causally prior state of existing in potency to its state of existing in actuality, well then there is an already actual cause of this transition. Now, this second reading here is straightforwardly incompatible with classical theism, right? Under classical theism, there is no state of potency existing causally prior to, God, to creation that God causes to transition from its state of potency to its state of actuality. That problematically entails, and rather clearly does, some kind of being, albeit potential being, existing apart from God, causally or ontologically prior to creation. And so the second reading of CP here rules out classical theism and a fortiori any argument, for example, the Aristotelian proof, in favor of it. So we're going to have to go with the first reading here. But importantly, the first reading doesn't seem any better for the Aristotelian proof, and in particular Trent's proof here as well. For starters, it doesn't, well, <laughs> Phaser doesn't justify it anywhere in his chapter. Um, but Trent also doesn't justify the principle. We've already covered that. I'm actually going to give here a rebutting defeater that, that um, it assumes that there's a potential for existence, but there can be no such thing. So um, for another thing, the first reading would straightforwardly debar the inference to a purely actual thing. So this is important. This is very important. This first reading here, if there are a range of potentials, uh, this straightforwardly debars the inference to a purely actual being. For suppose that the unactualized actualizer is simply a necessary but non-purely actual being, A. In that case, it's simply false that there are a range of potentials when it comes to the very being or existence or actuality of A, since A is necessarily existent. Thus, if the causal principle at play and Trent's proof and the Aristotelian proof were the one previously articulated, that first reading, well, then the Aristotelian proof would be incompatible. Excuse me. Then the Aristotelian proof would be incapable of justifying the need for a sustaining actualizing cause of A. And if the Aristotelian proof were incompatible, man, I did the same mistake! And if the Aristotelian proof were incapable of justifying the need for a sustaining actualizing cause of A, then it simply couldn't show that the unactualized actualizer is purely actual, since, for all the argument shows, a could be the unactualized actualizer, and A is not purely actual. So that, then, is that's a dilemma, right? It's a dilemma between the first and the second readings of the causal principle. Under either disjunct of the dilemma, the Aristotelian proof and Trent's proof fails. Under the first reading, 
excuse me, under the second reading, right, classical theism is false, and so the Aristotelian proof for classical theism fails. Under the first reading, as I just argued, the proof is categorically incapable, it's categorically impotent in establishing that the unactualized actualizer is purely actual. Either way, whichever reading you pick, and these are really the only two plausible readings, um, as I've argued elsewhere, but these are really the only two plausible readings of the causal principle, uh, and whichever one you pick, the Aristotelian proof fails. Now, uh, perhaps Faser would say that this represents a false dichotomy. Um, you know, maybe there's some other reading of the causal principle. Well, I have several replies. First, and this might be due to my lack of imagination, it's difficult for me to see any other plausible rendition or reading of what the causal principle amounts to. Second, if this dichotomy... Okay, well, uh, let me actually read this footnote. What makes things a little difficult, for me at least, is that Faser first defends the causal principles applied to change. Uh, but then later in his chapter, he takes an existential turn and applies the principle or a similar principle to the very existence of a substance at a given moment. Now, perhaps it's meant to be like a conjunctive principle, like maybe in the case of change, the second reading applies, but in the case of existence at a single moment, the first reading applies, or something very much like it. In any case, we can set that complication aside for present purposes, right? That's not going to work. That's simply incompatible. No, you... Well... Okay, ho hold on. Let me let me think this through. No, I, I still don't think it's going to work, because if you have the first reading or something very much like it, then it's going to apply, right? The complication is going to arise. Even if the dichotomy is not properly exhaustive, it's going to be difficult to find another alternative that doesn't succumb to the problems afflicting each thus far demarcated disjunct. If you make the principle to change or quasi-change centered, a la the second reading, You'll make the proof incompatible with classical theism on account of entailing a state of potential being, temporally or causally or ontologically prior to creation. If you make the principle two cross-world difference-centered, you'll fall into the same problems as earlier, namely one, the fact that it, it, isn't, ju it isn't justified either in chapter one or in Trent's opening statement, and two, such principles will undermine the inference to A's being purely actual, as opposed to necessarily actually existent while having potential for accidental change or accidental cross-world variance. This is a very fine line to walk along, and I'm skeptical it can be done. But I think the tension can also be cast in a non-dilemma form, and it is to this that I'll turn next. So I just, I, I just raised a dilemma based on uh, this premise here, based on there being such a potential for existence. But there's also a non-dilemma form that I'm going to be raising now. And this one is where I argue that there is no such thing as this potential for existence. So this requires some potential, Trent's proof requires some potential for existence that is brought to actuality. And this potential for existence is some kind of being, some kind of reality, on Phaser's view and also Trent's, Trent's view, presumably. Uh, but what to make, what are we to make of this potential being, right? To what or whom does this potential being, some potential for a substance's existence, belong? In what does it inhere? What's its locus, so to speak? The potential for S's existence surely cannot be some feature of S. For by Phaser's own lights, features are ontologically posterior to and dependent on the prior actuality of the substances in which they inhere. Trent also argued this in one of his rebuttals. Phaser writes, for instance, that attributes are ontologically dependent on substances. But in that case, S's actuality is prior to the potential for S's existence, in which case it is false. Pache, the... I think that's Pache. It might be... Anyway, I don't know how to pronounce this. You guys, please don't kill me. I say Pache. I don't know what it is. I probably sound absurd to you guys who know Latin. I probably sound absurd, but I'm an uncultured swine, so deal with it, okay? Deal with it! Deal with it, man! <laughs> okay, anyway, um, S's actuality, in that case, is prior to the potential for S's existence, in which case it is false. Pache the Aristotelian proof, or at least Pache what would need to be affirmed by the Aristotelian proof for its causal principle to apply, that the relevant potential is brought from potential being to actual being. But nor can it be a feature or something other than, nor, but nor can it be a feature of something other than S. For the only other options, with respect to God's creation of substances, are that it's a feature of God, or else floats free of God in a realm of pure potentiality, right? We're talking about creation itself, the very coming to be of substances, in the first place, at all, in reality. We could focus on the first substance or whatever that God created, like the universe is coming to be, or maybe an angel, or, or whatever. Um, and neither of these are acceptable by the classical theist's lights. God can have some uh, potential that inheres in him, and that is brought, causally brought to actuality, but nor can there be a realm of potential that floats free from God. And we already saw that it couldn't be in S itself, right? Because S's actuality is prior to uh, S's various attributes, like its potential, like its various potentials. Now, the trouble is precisely in what a potential for S's existence amounts to. Potentials, by Phaser's lights, enjoy some kind of being. There is thus some potential being corresponding to the relevant potential. 
this potential being, moreover, is reduced from potential being to actual being. This follows from Phaser's causal principle, which states something like, whatever reduces from potential being to actual being is causally actualized by another in a state of actuality. For the causal principle to apply in the relevant case, S's very existence, or perhaps S itself, must be in a state of potential being. And then it must be causally reduced from this state of potential being to a state of actual being. And it is this state of potential being that poses a challenge for classical theism, right? Under classical theism, creation is the very production of the entire substance, both potencies and actualities. It is not the causing of some state of potential being to be made into a state of actual being. In short, then, I'm urging that under classical theism, there is no such thing as a state of potential being corresponding to the potential for a, very, for a substance's very existence. For this potential to inhere in something actual, which, I take it, is a commitment of Aristotelian metaphysics, right? Potencies don't float free. They inhere in things, as it were. It must, this potential must inhere either in the substance in question or in God. Now, if you think it could inhere in something else, I have two responses. First, this rejoinder just pushes the dust under the rug, for I could simply rerun the argument in terms of that something else's potential for existence. And two, just imagine that the possible world under consideration is one in which God only creates S, in which case the worry is wholly circumvented. Okay, so, this potential again, um, it's going to have to inhere in something, because that's that's just a commitment of Aristotelian metaphysics. Potencies don't float free from substances. They inhere in substances. It must inhere either in the substance in question or in God. But the actual inherent base can't be the substance itself, for reasons articulated above. For another reason, it seems simply incoherent that the potential being in question inheres in the substance itself. For that to be true, the substance must be actually existent. But in that case, S's existence, or S itself, is not in a state of potency, precisely because S is actually existent. And hence it is false that S's existence, or S, is in potency. And hence it is false that there is such a thing as this potential for existence that is both potential being and that inheres in S, which contradicts our assumption for reductio that it is both potential and inheres in S. But nor can the actual inherent base be the classical theistic god, for obvious reasons, right? God is purely actual, and hence has no inherent potencies. Now you might say, oh, well, he has active potencies. Well, no, as Phaser points out in uh, page 43 of his book, Scholastic Metaphysics, active potencies are actually a kind of actuality. Uh, and moreover, the potency in question that we're talking about is causally reduced from potency to act, right? We're talking about a substance's very existence. And per Phaser's and Trent's own argument, that's causally reduced from potency to act. But nothing about God is causally reduced from potency to act, right? Nothing about God can be caused. So it's just confused to say that, uh, oh, Joe, you're you're mistaking, uh, little boy Joe, you're mistaking the uh, active potencies for the, uh, uh, the, the passive potencies. Like, no, no, I'm not. I'm not. Okay. Uh, and therein lies the problem, right? If, as the Aristotelian proof requires, there is such a thing as S's potential for existence, then this potential being must inhere in God or S, but it can inhere in neither. And so there is no such thing as S's potential for existence, which is precisely what Trent's argument needs in order for it to succeed. Premise 5 simply presupposes that there is such a thing as that. Now, again, like I said, Phaser may respond by distinguishing between passive and active potency. It's funny, I already anticipated this. Um, Again, yeah, no, the, I already anticipated that. Um, now, again, I'm not claiming that this is a problem for classical theism as such. My aim is just to pinpoint a fundamental tension between classical theism and the Aristotelian proof and Trent's argument's treatment of creation as the actualization of a potential. The central idea is that the Aristotelian's proof talk of the concurrent actualization of S's potential for existence is mistaken. This is such an ugly apostrophe. Look at that. This is so much better. Oh, my goodness. Um... That's just mistaken. Prior to S's existing, it cannot have any potentials, including a potential for existence. And prior to S's existing, God has no potentials. And so there's simply no such thing as this potential. Uh, it could only exist ontologically posterior to S's already actually being there. And yeah, so it, S's potential for existence cannot be actualized. Sure, S can be brought about. It can be produced in whole, both its potencies and actualities. But its potential for existence cannot be actualized. There's no such thing as that. And yet the Aristotelian proof requires the opposite, and hence the Aristotelian proof fails. So I went through a dilemma version of this. Uh, or I think this is actually kind of two criticisms of premise five. I went through a dilemma, but then I also argued that there's no such thing as this potential for existence. So premise five faces a problem as well. Um, in my view, this, is, this argument is just rife with problems, but let, let's go on. Um, I also say that premise five is unmotivated, right? Um, premise five says, if I can scroll properly, that anything that is changing has its potential for existence actualized by something else. But like, why? Why? Why is the mere fact that it's changing entail that it requires a sustaining cause of its very being or existence? Like, like what? Consider, suppose, right, suppose that neoclassical theism is true. Suppose that there's a foundational, necessarily existing concrete object that is a perfect being God, and God sustains everything else in being, but uh, God himself is temporal, and, and say he changes. Like, he, he knows that it's now uh, t noon, and then he knows that it's now 11, 1201, and then he knows that it's 1202. Okay, so he's changing in his knowledge. 
why does that entail that God requires a sustaining cause? Like, like what? <laughs> what? Uh, like, anyway, like, it doesn't even... I, I, okay, I know I try to have intellectual empathy, right? But it is so hard for me to see why the mere fact that something is changing entails that its very substantial being or existence requires a sustaining cause to keep it there, to keep it in existence. Why couldn't it be a necessarily existing perfect being that changes, say, in its knowledge continually, and that's in time? What is wrong with that? What's incoherent about that? Nothing that Phaser says rules that out. Nothing Trent says rules that out. Nothing in the Aristotelian proof rules that out. Nothing said by way of justification of its premises rules that out. Nothing. Okay, let me get off my high horse, and now let me get onto my pony, because we... <laughs> It's serious, man. Okay, so foundational necessarily existing thing. I'm having fun. Are you guys having fun? We're one hour and 20 minutes into this or something like that. You better be learning something, okay? You better be appreciating the majesty of reason, okay? Bow down to her majesty because reason is superior to all of us. Reason is immutable, eternal, necessarily existent. Plato's heaven. Okay, what am I doing? Sorry, you can see my mystical aspects of my existence coming through. I have gone insane over the past 24 hours. Okay, I need to calm down. <sighs> okay, Suppose, so anyway, this is unmotivated, okay? This is unmotivated. Suppose you're a theist who thinks that God is timeless, immutable, impassable, but nevertheless has some potential for cross-world variance, okay? Like different intrinsic knowledge states or numerically distinct time sacks of will. I went over this a little bit earlier, but it's germane here. Why should we conclude then on the basis of the Aristotelian proof that God, so conceived, requires a sustaining cause, right? Nothing in the Aristotelian proof requires that. Firstly, this being isn't changing, right? It's, we've supposed that it's timeless. Yes, it has cross-world variants, but it isn't changing. And so <laughs> the Aristotelian proof, even as Trent articulates it, it only says that whatever is changing requires that kind of sustaining cause. But then this thing wouldn't require a sustaining cause per that view. And yet this thing, ex hypothesi, has some potential, namely potential for cross-world variants, albeit no potential for change. And so even, even Trent's own argument is perfectly compatible with a thing having potential. Anyway, <laughs> But anyway, even ignoring that point, like, why on earth would this god, so construed, require a sustaining cause? What, what reason? Why? Why? Um, anyway, let's, let's go on. Uh, okay, and then my final response, so I, I've been leveling, well, I gave two responses here, um, right, uh, if I could only move. Man, what are we doing? So you guys are just going to have to deal with me. Oh, yeah, okay, premise five. So I gave two responses here. The first one was a dilemma. The second one was... Um, there is no such thing as this potential for existence. And then I went down and argued that uh, it's unmotivated, right? So that was, that was another response. That's my third response. My fourth response here is that I would only grant that whatever is changing, plausibly, requires an explanation for its existence and, indeed, its persistence. But there are boatloads of existential inertialist-friendly explanations of persistence, right? The premise in question assumes that the only adequate explanation of something's potential for existence and a non-first moment of its existence is a sustaining cause. But that is flatly false. There are a whole panoplies of inertialist-friendly explanations of persistence. As I point out and argue in depth, systematically, in this blog post right here, it's like 60,000 words. It's part in, it, it derives from my book project that I have under review right now. Um, so... I develop in section five of this blog post. I mean, you guys, if any of you want to have an informed opinion on existential inertia, uh, it's impossible to have that with, if you don't read this, that, that, that's my unbiased opinion. It's impossible to have an informed view on the debate if you, if you don't get this, because, um, I address basically, I systematically go through every single objection that has been leveled towards existential inertia in the literature here. And I also articulate existential inertia under different temporal ontologies. I look at its relationship to relativity theory, and I also go through a variety of different metaphysical accounts of existential inertia. That is, inertialist friendly explanations of persistence. So persistence is not brute under existential inertia. Screw brute facts, man. I don't believe in those things. Those are myths. I mean, if you mean by brute fact, a contingent brute fact. I mean... <laughs> Okay, so um, anyway, I'll just give a short version. So there are boatloads of existential inertialist friendly explanations of persistence. Here's a shortened version. Um, so Bodoin, for instance, he provides a metaphysical account on which O's inertial persistence is explained by the following conjunction. One, the only power capable of annihilating O has thus far been unexercised, and two, O lacks a tendency to spontaneously disappear. And again, guys, I, I, uh, you might be thinking like, and I go through each of these in depth in this link here. This is a short version. I'm, this is this is a very quick summary. I, uh, you might have objections to these, but read this bloody article here. Read it. Read it. Read it! Okay, anyway. Um, 
Premise one, no, this is not a premise. You can tell that I'm going insane. I'm gradually going insane as you listen to this. Okay, Bodwin provides a metaphysical account on which O's inertial persistence is explained by the following conjunction. One, the only, oh, I already said that. Benocci, Matteo Benocci, Matteo Benocci. Uh, he adduces a lightweight account of dispositions in conjunction with the complementarity principle to account for inertial persistence. These are what we might call tenancy or disposition-based accounts. David Oderberg actually develops one. I think I have that in a footnote, do I? Yeah, okay, so I, I also point out Odeberg. Um, Odeberg also developed one where things have a tendency to persist in existence. But that isn't utterly essential to existential inertia. That's just one metaphysical account of existential inertia. Things have a, so the tendency in some sense explains the persistence, uh, and things have that tendency uh, by their very nature. I address a, a circularity objection in here. Again, check it out. Another family accounts would be transtemporal accounts. These accounts adduce some kind of transtemporal relation or relations to explain inertial persistence. Um, so in elsewhere in my published work, I've uh, said that in principle, um, the conjunction of an absence of sufficiently destructive causal factors plus some kind of transtemporal explanatory relation. So that's a relation between the successive stages or phases of an object's life. For instance, um, one stage uh, causally produces the next stage in conjunction with there being no um, causal factors that frustrate that causal production. Uh, that could explain the persistence. Um, J.L. Mackey also gives a similar thing, and other authors have done that as well. There are also law-based accounts. I'm not going to go through this here, but Tim Maudlin has a law-based account um, that can be co-opted for existential inertia. Another family account could be called necessity accounts. Um, these explain existential inertia by appeal to necessity of some kind. You could have, for instance, the primitive uh, metaphysical necessity of the inertial thesis. Again, I outline all of this more in this document up here or in this blog post up here, read it, definitely read it, 1,000% read it. Uh, or you could just have, you could explain persistence of non-fundamental, non-foundational temporal concreta by their being caused by or grounded in or realized by or constituted by or more fundamental foundational temporal concreta that exist of metaphysical necessity. Uh, and that, it, yeah, they're, they're foundational. And so um, in this case, some subset, yeah, sure, there are some temporal things that are sustained from without under this metaphysical account of inertial persistence, but existential inertia is still true, EIT is still true under this because Remember, EIT quantifies over temporal concrete objects or some subset thereof. And so what could this be? Well, there are whole panoplies of options. You could have it be theist-friendly. That could be uh, the panentheistic god, a neoclassical theistic god, all sorts of different views. Uh, or it could be non-theist-friendly, right? It might be quantum fields or superstrings, the universal wave function or quarks or mariological simples or uh, whole panoplies of things. So many options for the non-theist. Um, anyway, uh, there are also accounts that are called no-change accounts. These accounts view persistence as an absence of change and take this, take this fact to be central to their explanation of inertial persistence. Again, see the document. Uh, uh, Bede Rundle has given one of these, Oppie has given one of these, and so on. And then uh, Valding Thorson, who uh, in his book A Powerful Particulars View of Causation published in 2021, it's actually open access, you guys can read it online, he gives a causal interactionist view uh, uh, that explains inertial persistence of composite objects. Um, anyway, check out Check out this uh, blog post above for more. My point here is just that premise five requires, so that, again, this is another one of my criticisms. I gave the first two earlier, then I argued that premise five is unmotivated, and now I'm giving yet another criticism of premise five, in that it assumes that the only adequate explanation of something's potential for existence at a non-first moment of its existence is a sustaining cause, but that's blatantly false. Uh, okay, because there are whole panoplies of existential inertialist friendly explanations of persistence. Okay. Premise 8. We're moving on to premise 8. We're getting close. We're getting close to the claw. <laughs> okay. <sighs> okay, so the first actualizer could not have any potential. So this is what Trent says, I, I believe, right? Let me put this. Trent. The first actualizer could not have any potential. And so it must be unactual. Oh, yeah, yeah. So this is his premise. Um, oh, no, this is premise 8. Man, you can see I'm, I'm going insane. So, yeah, he says the first actualizer couldn't have any potential, so it must be an unactualized actualizer. That was just pure act. I've already covered that. There are tons of non sequiturs here. <gasps> premise 9, if something's pure act, it would be God. I already went over that. There are tons of non sequiturs here, and we're done. We're done. We're done with the, 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 the argument from change or motion. There were so many problems with it, as I've argued, um, and they seem rather... Well, they seem very forceful to my mind, but um, anyway, I hope they serve you, right? Even if you disagree with me. Even if you disagree with me, I hope that my criticisms serve you, that they help you think critically about these issues, that they help you think critically and reflectively about the fundamental nature of reality. Yeah, we're getting serious here, right? I want my videos to serve you guys. I don't, I don't exactly care, ultimately, if you guys agree with what I say in all of my videos. I want you to be able to think. I want you to be able to, to reason, critically reflect on reality, on our position in the world on the meaning of our lives, on ultimate reality, on the nature of persistence, on the nature of change, on God's existence, on everything. I want you to be able to think. I care more 
about you guys being able to think critically. That's why I wrote my, my first book, right? I want you guys to be able to think. And so that's why I do all of this, right? <laughs> I mean, of course, I'm interested in the, the conclusions to be drawn, right? I'm certainly interested in that. But I want you guys more fundamentally to be able to use the way that I go about navigating these things and just the, the way that I present these things and the, the, the certain arguments and distinctions drawn and the way that you can object to things, rebutting to views, undercutting to views. I want all of that for you guys to absorb that. That's, that's a bigger aim of my channel, a bigger aim of my videos than, than the conclusions that I draw. Of course, I, I mean, I, it'd be nice if you could share my conclusions because I think that they're right. But ultimately, I care more about you being able to think critically about these things. And I care, I care much more, than, even than that, about your epistemic virtues in doing it. That um, you can keep an open mind, that you can have the requisite intellectual humility, that you can... Um, yeah, anyway. <sighs> Off my high horse again. We're going on to the Kalam! This is going to be so fun! Okay, an hour and 30 minutes in. Let me note that. Okay, so... Uh, Trent Horn said an infinite pass is impossible because of Hilbert's Hotel, or he said something along those lines. That was basically his argument. Now, I've addressed Hilbert's Hotel at length, that argument with Alex Malpass, in this video here, so I highly recommend clicking it. I'll be brief here, or <laughs> as brief as Joe can be. Um, so first, I don't find it counterintuitive. I don't find Hilbert's Hotel counterintuitive at all. I don't find it absurd at all. I don't find anything about it counterintuitive. That's an honest self-report, right? I'm just confessing to you guys. Maybe it's because I've been exposed to, you know, Cantorian set theory and so on from a very young age, and I, I'm just used to all this stuff. Maybe that's it. But whatever the causal origin of my self-report is, I can still just report to you that I find absolutely nothing absurd or counterintuitive about Hilbert's hotel. It's exactly what I would expect, and I think what we should expect with an infinitely capacious hotel. Of course you can remove guests and add more. Of course you can subtract more. Of course, depending on the way that you subtract guests, of course you can get um, subtract infinitely many and still have infinitely many left over. And of course you can subtract infinitely many and have three left over. Um, you're, do, you're subtracting in different ways there. You're, you're taking out um, all numbers greater than three in one case and then all even numbers in one case. There's nothing absurd or uh, unclear or there, there, there's nothing absurd or counterintuitive about that. That's exactly what we should expect. Anyway, I'm just reporting to you that I find nothing here counterintuitive, nothing here absurd. And so at least for me, this is utterly evidentially what, insalient? Evidentially salient means it's like evidentially relevant and has evidential significance for you. So what's the opposite of salient? Insalient? Unsalient? Non-salient? I'll leave it up to you. But so anyway, at least for me and for those who share my, my self-report here, this is not going to provide any reason to think that an infinite past is impossible. So that's one thing that I want to say. And that points to the person-based nature of justification, which I've gone at ad nauseum on my channel. Okay, so second, the, uh, so that's the first problem. <laughs> problem for those who share my self-report. I mean, it's a problem for me. I, mean, I, I don't think this is at all convincing um, by my lights. So second, the argument relies on an inference from seems strange to impossible. Strictly speaking, this is a non sequitur, right? Lots of things seem strange or unintuitive, like the subsistent act of being itself, that aren't, by dint of that strangeness, impossible. That's the th second response. Third, Trent has arguably disproved Christianity. So this is where the, the title comes in. It's not clickbait, people. Okay, so th Trent has arguably disproved Christianity. So allow me to explain. If Christianity is true, there is an endless afterlife, right? That's, that's part of Christianity. There's an endless afterlife. You might be in heaven. You might be in hell. You might be uh, in purgatory, but that's not going to be permanent. Um, anyway, we're not going to get into debates there. If Christianity is true, then there is an endless afterlife. But if there's an endless afterlife, then the number of future days slash events, each of which is such that it will happen, is infinite, right? Like if, um, like if the, if the future was such that there were seven days left, how many days or how many days or events, well, we could speak of days, how many days would be such that each of which will happen? The answer is seven, because there's only a week left in existence in reality. Uh, if there were two weeks, the answer would be 14. If there were three weeks, the answer would be 21, you know, taking you back to third grade in our, our multiplication table. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm taking Trent back to third grade. No, I'm, I'm making a joke. It wasn't funny, but I was attempting to make a joke. So I get points for trying. Uh, so again, if there are, if there's a week to go in the future and then reality will stop, well then the number of future days, which are such that they will happen, is seven. And same with an endless afterlife. If the number of future, if, if the future is never going to come to an end, then the number of days, which are such that they will happen, is infinite. And again, we could we could cast this in terms of events, you know. So we could um, 
anyway, we can we can put this in terms of events as well. So even if there aren't days in the afterlife as as we know them here, uh, there will presumably still be events. I mean, that's going to have. <laughs> Per Trent's own view, there are going to have to be events that mark the passage of time there. So um, we can still count the events. Okay, so, but I'm just going to speak of days for simplicity, but we don't, that's not essential. Okay, but now suppose a year passes by. Suppose, in other words, that it's September of 2022, not 2021. Even still, the number of future days, each of which is such that it will happen, is infinite. Hence, even after subtracting 365 days, or n events, from the infinite collection of future days, the collection is still infinite. Now suppose that on each day of the endless future, the angels Gabriel and Michael alternate singing praises to God. They decide together today to start this process tomorrow. So, tomorrow, Gabriel sings, the next day Michael sings, followed by Gabriel, and so on, into the endless future. But now imagine that Michael decided, so this is a different possible world, now imagine that Michael decided not to join Gabriel, but that Gabriel still wants a day to relax in between his days of singing praise. So Gabriel proceeds as before without Michael singing any praises. But look what we've just got, right? In the first scenario, we have infinitely many praises, each of which is sung on each day of the endless future. But we subtracted every other praise to get to the second scenario, and hence we subtracted infinitely many praises. But yet there are still infinitely many praises, each of which is such that it will be sung in the second scenario. But now suppose in a different world that Michael and Gabriel today decide to simply alternate their praises for 365 days and then relax for the rest of eternity. In this case, we have subtracted infinitely many days of praise from the first scenario, and now we only have 365 days of praise, each of which is such that it will occur. Hence, infinity minus infinity is infinity, and yet infinity minus infinity is 365. Absurd! Hence, the future cannot be endless, right? If the future could be endless, then we would have these different possible worlds in which we could have these different possible worlds in which these things obtain. But in these different possible worlds, right? This represents a kind of subtraction, one from the other. We have infinitely many, in one case, a collection, and then we have the same collection, but just remove the even-numbered elements, essentially, in the other one, and then the same collection, but just remove all the elements greater than 365 in one of them, and you get three different possible worlds. And yet, this kind of removal, this subtraction, allows us to say that we have this infinitely infinite collection, and then we subtract infinitely many of those elements, but yet we still have infinity, infinity, and we do it again, we subtract infinitely many elements, and then we have 365, which is quote-unquote absurd by the lights of people who defend Hilbert's Hotel. Since this would be, since these sorts of scenarios would be possible if the future were endless, and since this is absurd, and hence impossible by Trent's own lights, it follows that the future cannot be endless. For if it could be endless, then obviously some angels could sing some praises in the manners described. Even if you disagree with that, there's really no escaping the absurd subtractions. We can suppose, for instance, that in one world God creates a point-sized particle on each day of the endless future, in another world he alternates days that he creates, and finally in another he simply creates for the next 365 days. So, Trent has furnished us with an argument against Christianity. Premise 1. If the future could be endless, then subtractions, like the ones above, would be possible. 2. But those subtractions are allegedly absurd and hence impossible. 3. Hence, the future cannot be endless. 4. If Christianity is true, there is an endless future in the afterlife. 5. So, Christianity is false. Trent also tries to use Loke's argument that if the past is beginningless, then on each day of the past, a builder could build a room and then a hotel could be constructed in the present. But Malpass and Morstan, this is my humble opinion, Malpass and Morstan rather decisively criticize this in their 2020 article in the Philosophical Quarterly entitled Endless and Infinite. They, they respond to exactly what Trent is uh, propounding. Uh, they, they quote one of um, uh, Alex Pruce's blog posts where he develops a similar kind of argument, and they, they, uh, they quote and, or they address Andrew Loke's version, rendition of the argument, which is essentially the same thing that Trent points out here, like that each day of the past, a builder could build a room. Um, so Trent then gives, so anyway, uh, Trent has arguably disproved Christianity here, which is interesting. Um, you don't all too often see Christian apologists disproving Christianity. Um, but uh, <laughs> obviously I'm being slightly facetious, but I do think that his argument, if successful, would disprove Christianity. So um, as I argued here, uh, and so, I mean, I, I've already given one response there, two responses there. Um, here's my third response. Uh, uh, fourth response here. Now on to a fifth, re well, this is not really a fifth response. We're going on to his Benedetti paradox, okay? So this is where he, he basically gives another paradox, the Benedetti paradox, and where it has two conditions. These are the two conditions of the unsatisfiable pair for those who are privy to the debates that are going on there. The A condition is as follows, each builder writes their room number on the paper if and only if no previous builder does, and B, there is a beginningless series of such builders. Now these two are jointly unsatisfiable, together they strictly entail a contradiction, hence the paradox. Now uh, Trent's argument is basically, if a beginningless past were possible, well then the joint satisfaction of A and B would be possible, 
But two, the joint satisfaction of A and B above, that's impossible, right? They're contradictory. You can just demonstrate that. And hence, a beginningless past is impossible. Now, there are five problems with the Benedetti paradox here. First, the unsatisfiable pair diagnosis, or UPD, is by my lights the best solution to it. You can see my video with Alex Malpass here. I also made a blog post response to Cameron where he tried to use a Patrick principle, but it ultimately ended up not being compatible with theism, I argued. Um, so you could check out my blog post there. It's something like Cam's Kalam and the unsatisfiable pair diagnosis. You can search that up. Second, in order to infer the impossibility of an infinite past or an infinite causal chain, from this argument, we need something like a Patrick principle, right? We, we need something that takes us from a possible world in which an infinite past obtains to a possible world, to a quote unquote possible world in which the paradox is created, from which we could then infer that since the latter is impossible, so is the former. But these, right, because obviously in the actual world, right, suppose that the past is infinite in the actual world. Well, since it's actual, there's obviously no contradiction there. So then what phase, or what phaser, what Trent is saying, he, he wants to say, like, if it could be the case, if it could actually be the case that the past is infinite, well then we could have this other possible world where there's this really strange building scenario and then they pass the papers in the paradoxical manner described. But in order to get that, you're going to have to, you're going to have to use some kind of Patrick principle to take us from this possibility to the next possibility. I actually discuss why you need that in my video response to Trent Horn here. And again, Trent Horn is going to be responding to my response there uh, on Monday. So, um, and again, I'll be responding to his response to my response, Inception. I'll be responding to him um, in the coming weeks or something like that. But anyway, my point is just that um, Trent's going to have to have something like this Patrick principle to, to justify this premise one. You need to go from the framework of beginningless past, and then you need to be able to patch up a world where A and B are jointly satisfied. You need somehow to bridge that gap from the mere possibility of beginningless past, which by itself doesn't seem absurd. You're just saying the past is beginningless. And that you, but you, then you need to get some kind of absurdity there. So you need to add some kind of framework that you're patching in certain um, individual reapers, say, or individual builders. And then they perform their various actions, and then you get the contradiction. So you need something like a Patrick principle. But these Patrick principles are notoriously unreliable, face serious problems, including with theism itself, right? If the Patrick, if we could use a Patrick principle, then we could patch up a possible world which contains nothing but absolutely horrific and horrendous evils. Uh, and because, again, because we're using the Patrick principle, we can um, ensure that we're only patching together the horrendous evils and not patching um, the goods that accrue from them. Um, that's just what Patrick principles require. Uh, they, they require that there are no necessary connections among the intrinsic features of distinct things as... Um, as Rob Coons has recognized in his published work, as David Lewis, who is the originator of Patrick Principles, recognizes, um, you're you're going to be able to patch up a patch up a world where these horrific evils obtain with no outweighing goods. In which case, I mean that's that's arguably just not going to be compatible with God's existence. Um, God's going to have to God's going to need some kind of reason to allow such horrific evils, and that's going to have to come by way of some goods that, that accrue. But if we're patching up a world in which the goods don't accrue, well then we have a possible world in which God doesn't exist, and by S5, it follows that God cannot exist. Uh, so Patrick principles are notoriously unreliable. They face serious problems. They arguably undermine, not only undermine, but rebut theism, if true. And they also grow out of a false human picture of reality as devoid of necessary connections among distinct things, or at least among the intrinsic features of distinct things. Again, see my video response to Trent Horn here. So that's the third problem. Uh, with the, the Benedetti paradox. Fourth, it presupposes the falsity of a branching theory of modality. I explain this further in my video to response to Trent Horn here. It's, that's a little bit of a complicated critique, so I just it, uh, direct you to that. Graham Oppy has pointed this out in one of his reviews of, um, dang it, it was someone's book. It might have been, uh, uh Proust's book. It, it might have been someone else's, but, but he points out that, um, the Benedetti scenarios, if you have a branching theory of modality, which is highly popular, Proust himself defends it. Coons accepts, uh, a version of it. I accept it, Malpass accepts it, Josh Rasmussen is sympathetic with it, and so on. Um, it's a sort of branching or causal powers-based or more so Aristotelian-based view of modality. And, you know, there are some minor variations in, in the, the thinkers that I just specified. Anyway, my point is just that this is a little bit of a complicated critique, and you can see my video there um, as to why it presupposes it's being false, but doesn't, doesn't justify it. Um, now, fifth... Okay, I guess I'll say something by way of justifying it. So if the branching theory is true, then whatever is possible is either actual or it's the result of the outworkings of the causal powers of actual things. So all possibilities are ultimately grounded in actualities. And in that case, right, since the actual world is obviously not contradictory and doesn't have this Benedetti structure, it follows, and we, if we suppose that the actual world is, is 
um, endless in the past, excuse me, beginningless in the past, well then you're just not going to be able to construct another world from this world, which is such that its infinite past is populated by these reapers or by these um, builders and, and pa or paper passers or whatever. Because then there would have to be something in the actual world with the causal power of making it such that the entire past was different than it in fact was. That's going to require some kind of retrocausation. Or, I mean, I guess you could have that with a timeless god, but that's not going to be convincing. To, <laughs> this is an argument for God's existence, so this is obviously that's obviously not going to be convincing to naturalists. So, um, so long as we have, so long as the naturalist has a branching view of modality, they can think that the past is is beginningless, and you actually won't be able to infer from the from the possibility of beginningless past uh, that this the Benedetti paradoxes are possible. Because if you have a branching view of modality, well, then there's nothing in reality that could be such that it could change the entire history of reality so as to be different than it in fact is. So as to include that beginningless series of grim reapers or grim messengers or paper passers and whatnot. Again, see my video there. I explain it. I'm not doing this off the cuff here, okay? So, <laughs> so explain that, that, um, or go see my video there, my response to Trent Horn there. And then fifth, there are symmetrical Benedetti paradoxes that would likewise disprove an endless future and hence Christianity along with it. So see another one of my videos with Alex Malpass here. So again, the argument that Trent's leveling is basically if a beginningless past were possible, then the joint satisfaction of A and B here would likewise be possible, but that's not possible and hence a beginningless past is impossible. But now consider the following. If the future is endless and if God exists, which Trent grants, then God could create one angel on each day of the endless future, giving each such angel a unique natural number and a paper and pencil. The angel created tomorrow gets number one, the angel created the next day gets number two, and so on ad infinitum. Each angel follows the following rule. This is the same rule the builders follow, just in the opposite direction, by the way. So A, write my number on the paper, if and only if, no later angel does that, writes their number on the paper. And B, there is an endless series of such angels. A is the rule that they're following, B is the, the, like, the sort of the framework. How do the angels know A, right? How do they know that, uh, you know, how do they decide to write their number on the paper if only if no later angel does? I mean, like, how do they know the future? Well, God, under Trent's view, has comprehensive foreknowledge of the future, and hence he knows whether any angel writes their number in the future. And so on the day an angel is created, God simply reveals to the angel upon its creation whether another angel will write their number on the paper in the future. And yet, we get a contradiction here from this setup, right? Pick, pick an arbitrary angel N, okay? That's a number, number N. Does angel N write its number? Well, suppose it does. Well, then no angel greater than N writes... Excuse me, well, then no angel greater than N will write its number. But, obviously, it follows then that no angel greater than N plus 1 will write its number. But given the A condition above, that can't be, right? Since if no angel greater than N plus 1 will write its number, well, then angel N plus 1 writes its number. And that's a contradiction. It follows then that angel n for any arbitrary n doesn't write its number. And that argument was perfectly general, right? I picked an arbitrary n, and hence the above reasoning holds for each natural number n, and hence none of the angels write their number. But if none of the angels write their number, then obviously no angels later than angel number one will write its number, right? But since angel number one writes its number, if no angels later than itself will write their number, right? That's condition A. It follows that angel number one writes its number. Hence, none of the angels write their number, but at least one does. A contradiction. And thus we have a full-blooded, future-oriented Benedetti paradox on our hands. And we also have a symmetry argument on our hands. Premise one, if an endless future were possible, the joint satisfaction of A and B above, this A and B right here, the joint satisfaction of A and B above would be possible. I guess I could conclude here, and God exists and has comprehensive foreknowledge of the future. But that's going to be okay with, with Trent. So, uh, if an endless future were possible, the joint satisfaction of A and B above would be possible. Two, the joint satisfaction of A and B above is not possible, as I demonstrated here. Hence, an endless future is impossible. But if Christianity is true, the future is endless. And hence, by the way, Christianity is false. So again, uh, I'll leave it up to you. Has Trent Horn disproved Christianity? Uh, now, as Alex and I point out in our video on the symmetrical future-oriented paradoxes, pretty much any response you give to this paradox will equally undermine the past-oriented paradox. <laughs> paradoxes. Like, if you're going to use the Patrick principle, um, yeah, we can also... Like, if you use the framework of a beginningless past and then patch up reapers or paper passers or whatever uh, in order to fill that, 
endless past, and then you can try to say that, oh, well, then they, since they have their intrinsic causal powers, they can write their paper if only if no later one does that. You can equally patch up a world so long as you have a framework of an endless future, and then you can populate that endless future. You can patch up a possible world where that happens. Uh, and, and so you get the same problem. Mysterious forces, yeah, right? You might say, oh, well, uh, you know, that scenario couldn't obtain because A and B are jointly unsatisfiable and, you know, something along the lines. Or like, you know, God couldn't do that because it would create a contradiction. Well, well, oh, well, then I can say this, you know, that's the same thing that we're saying in the beginningless past version. No, that couldn't happen because it's impossible. It creates a contradiction. They're jointly logically unsatisfiable. Then you might say, you know, and I could, I could just, I could do the same move that Proust and Erasmus and Luna and so on they do uh, in response to that. They're like, oh well, is then there is there some mysterious force that prevents this paradox from uh, from coming to be if the past is beginning less? Well, I could say the same thing here. Is there some be is there some mysterious force that prevents uh, angels from doing this in the future? Is there some mysterious force that prevents God from from uh, you know having this uh, foreknowledge and revealing it to the angels in this way? Like, listen, no, like any response that you give, and again, see the video um, that I did with Alex Malpass, any response that you give to this future-oriented paradox will arguably um, uh, equally undermine the past-oriented paradox. Interestingly, some people, I mean, one way that you can go with this is open theism, and this actually is a p potentially interesting argument for open theism. I, I think we should just embrace the unsatisfiable paradiagnosis. That's the best solution to this, but um, uh, some people I know have um, use this actually as an argument for open theism. In fact, Josh Rasmussen has suggested that um, to me. And uh, anyway, uh, I don't need to get into that too much. And so Trent's arguments for the finitude of the past, while suffering from many, many independent problems in their own right, would equally entail that, by the way, Christianity is false TM. Now, note, Alex and I discuss and criticize the view of the afterlife on which it's some kind of timeless existence. So see our video there. But let's continue on with Trent's argument. So he says, if the past is finite, then the universe began to exist from a state of nothing. Well, what I say is it depends on what you mean by a state of nothing in the universe. Here are four options that we have. We could say that the universe came into being without any cause whatsoever. I think that's false, so let's set that aside. Second, we can say the universe came into being with a cause, and that cause existed in a non-metric, amorphous time prior to the universe's beginning. This is defended by Alan Paget, Richard Swinburne, Richard Swinburne, Ryan Mullins, and many others, that is to say. Uh, it's a popular view about, for example, God's relation to time. William Lane Craig has even said that he's open to this view in his recent Capturing Christianity dialogue with Scott Clifton. This view entails that the past is finite, by the way, right? Metric time did indeed have a beginning, and before that there was non-metric time, which is not past infinite, right? Then it would be metricated. You'd be able to say, uh, you'd be able to talk about its length and so on. Um, a non-metric time is amorphous. It doesn't have some kind of metrication by which you can say it. it's like infinitely distant into the past. And so here you don't have a you don't have a, an infinite past. You don't have all the quote unquote paradoxes that follow from it. But importantly, the naturalist can make use of this too. Simply suppose there is some natural entity, for example, a universal wave function or a quantum field or a physical thing we know not what that existed in a non-metric time prior to the universe that indeterministically or spontaneously caused the universe to begin or caused metric time. Uh, to begin to exist. Uh, another, another option is that the universe came into being with a cause, and that cause existed sans the universe timelessly, but temporally since the universe came into being, or perhaps it ceased to exist after its causal production was done with. Now, this is Craig, not the ceasing to exist one, but this is Craig's view he, he's defended for decades. Um, as before, there are naturalist-friendly proposals here too, right? Many philosophers of physics accept wave function monism, uh, or at least a temporal wave function monism, on which there is a non-spatial temporal universal wave function that explains less fundamental physical things. The non-spatial temporal thing that was causally prior to the universe's beginning may very well be a naturalistically acceptable entity like this. Here's the fourth option. The universe came to being with a cause, and that cause is timeless simpliciter, full stop. This is an option, but it faces the problems associated with divine timelessness in its theistic incarnation. The non-theist can hold that the non-spatial temporal universe, moreover, or the non-spatial temporal universal wave function, say, or some non-spatial temporal quantum field like entity serves this role as well. So <laughs> this claim it just it depends on what you mean by universe and state of nothingness. Um, if by universe you mean the collection of all spatial temporal things, or if by, I mean, it, that, that wouldn't be true because you could have a temporal thing that exists before it as seen by this non-metric time proposal. And presumably it could also be spatial there as well. Uh, if you mean all natural things or all physical things, that's simply false. As we've seen, there could be, for instance, a timeless physical thing that's timeless sans the beginning of the universe and temporal sans. Or maybe it's just timeless simpliciter, a la a temporal wave function monism. Options abound for the naturalist. Now notice that nothing here by itself gives any weight to theism. 
as shown above, atheism slash naturalism are perfectly compatible. Say it louder for those at the back, right? <laughs> atheism and naturalism are perfectly compatible with there being a cause at the beginning of metric time. Atheism and naturalism does not entail, or they do not entail, that the universe came into being without any cause or explanation. I, again, say it louder for those in the back. Now, again, people, I'm not saying that Trent says this, right? I'm not saying that Trent has said this here. I'm, I'm saying what I'm saying here because, all of, because of all of my headaches that have been caused by people saying atheism slash naturalism entails that, univer that the universe came into being uncaused. It doesn't. Stop saying that. It makes you look ignorant. Okay, we're on to the moral argument. Peeps, we're getting closer to the end, okay? We're coming up on two hours. I, I'm, I'm going to note this. We're at like 154.25. All right, me, run to the moral argument a lot. Okay, so Trent asks, what grounds are equal rights? So here's my tentative answer, the first portion of which Trent seems to agree with. I'd say probably the fact that we all share human nature with its, ver with its various causal powers and capacities entailed therefrom. We just need the intrinsic nature of humanity, which might be a collection of essential features or capacities or, or whatever, which in turn can be cast in Aristotelian or Platonic or even nominalist friendly terms. Why would something extrinsic to us have anything to do with our equality, right? Isn't it something about us that accounts for it? Moreover, how could God ground this fact? By taking some attitude to us? That is, by considering us as all to be equal, as beloved sons and daughters of his making? But this faces a serious challenge. Again, I'm not saying that, that Trent adopts this particular view. I'm, I'm just giving a problem for the view. This is a proposal that someone might propose. Again, how could God ground the fact that we have equal rights, our equal dignity and worth and so on? Is it by taking some attitude to us, that is, as considering us all to be equal, as beloved sons and daughters of his making? But that faces a serious challenge, right? Does God have any reason to do this? If so, then surely it's that reason that's doing the explanatory heavy lifting, that is, that's accounting for our moral worth, our equal worth. God is just recognizing a reason that was already there to take us to be, that is, to consider us as equal. But if God has no reason to do this, then his taking us to be equal is utterly arbitrary. There's no rhyme or reason to it, so pick your poison. Moreover, God either recognizes something about us that leads him to value us all equally, or he doesn't. If he does, then something about us grounds our equal dignity. If he doesn't, then either nothing leads him to value us all equally, or else something entirely other than us does. If it's nothing, then God's valuing us all equally is arbitrary. If it isn't based on, you know, it's, it isn't then based on anything. If it's something entirely other than us, however, then once more, surely it is that other thing that accounts for our equal worth or dignity. And again, I'm not saying Trent adopts the view above that I've been criticizing. I've seen others adopt it. And I'm trying here... Excuse me, I've seen others adopt it and try to use it to argue for theism, and I wanted to dispel with it here. Trent then says, atheism leads to the conclusion that species membership is morally irrelevant, but theism can explain why only humans have intrinsic value. <laughs> okay, I said hold up. First, even if humans enjoy some privileged moral status, that doesn't mean only human animals have intrinsic value. I mean, surely like a chimpanzee has, has intrinsic value as, as a being, right? Chimpanzees have love and desire. You know, they have, they have loves and desires and so on. You know, they have uh, families and uh, they play, they laugh, right? You can see videos online where um, one of them's like laughing at a joke that a magician or, you know, some kind of magic trick. Um, if, if they don't have any intrinsic value, I'm not sure I know what intrinsic value is. Um, are they, like they're valuable only instrumentally as a means for, for us maybe or for ecosystem? Like that just, okay. Anyway, um, so my point here is just that things could have varying degrees of intrinsic value, right? With humanity, by dint of our exceptional powers possessed by nature, even if by some accident of genetics or physical damage or whatever, these powers as manifestation conditions have been frustrated, right? These, these things could have varying degrees of intrinsic value with humanity making the top of the list, again, by dint of or by virtue of our exceptional powers possessed by nature. This isn't all that implausible, right? Humans have art, creativity, exceptional higher-order awareness, rationality, capacity for abstract thought and representation, virtue, both epistemic and moral, and the capacity to give genuine gifts of ourselves to others in acts of love, right? These, or at least some of these powers, have by all humans, since they are essential properties, again, even if their manifestation conditions are frustrated by some defect, surely ground, right, these, or at least some of these properties or powers, surely ground our status as top of the chain of intrinsic value, if, of course, we enjoy such a status. This has nothing to do with God, right? These are all intrinsic features of humans. They have nothing to do with some extrinsic relation they bear to God, or God's commands, or God's attitude, or God's nature, or whatever, right? And this is all perfectly kosher to non-theists, for example, naturalists, since 
Nothing I said above about natures or properties or causal powers or manifestation conditions and so on are exclusive to theism. Indeed, most philosophers working on such topics are non-theists. And I add again that all my talk here can be cast in Aristotelian, Platonic, or nominalist-friendly terms. It just takes some minor adjustments with the substance staying the same. I take it then that it's clearly false to say, as Trent did, that atheism entails that species membership is morally irrelevant. Trent also said theists can account for it. But I doubt that, right? Again, God either recognizes something about us that leads him to value us above all the other animals, or he doesn't. And moreover, God either has some reason for this, or he doesn't. The same problems as before will erupt. I mean, technically, Trent hasn't fleshed out his theistic account, at least as I was writing this. Um, so I don't know what precise aspect of God he grounds this stuff in, but I would argue actually that whatever he picks, we can run my arguments mutatis mutandis. Like um, if God's, if it's God's nature instead of his commands or his attitudes uh, that ground the, the worth of humanity, right? Th there's either some underlying more fundamental reason why that nature is such that it, it grounds our, our worth, or there isn't, right? If there isn't, then there's just a kind of arbitrary connection there. But if there is, then surely it's that more fundamental reason that explains it, right? Maybe it's because we uh, have all those various intrinsic features above, right? Uh, but then those are perfectly kosher by naturalist lights and so on. So anyway, uh, Trent said theists can account for it, but I doubt that. Trent then talks about human evils. So he says, if humans are just another species that act in accordance with physical laws, then there is no reason to assume that they have moral responsibility. Um, no reason? I, I said, bruh, like, bruh, <laughs> suppose we think that a being which is rational and acts of their own free will is morally responsible for the actions they do freely and knowingly. That seems rather self-evident, right? That just seems self-evident. We therefore have a reason to assume moral responsibility, right? <laughs> if someone does something of their own free will and and they do it knowingly and rationally. Obviously, that that's all there is. That, that's all you need, really, for, for them to be morally responsible for the actions they do freely and knowingly, right? The question, then, is whether atheism entails that we cannot be rational and act of our own free will. First, nowhere does Trent justify this. But second, pretty much every account of free will and rationality in the literature don't make any reference to God. Not all accounts, but pretty much every account. They are entirely independent of God, right? You'll find libertarians and compatibilists alike, who, one, have accounts that are not at all theistic, and two, are not themselves theists. These are strong indicators, I would say, that theism has, does not have custody over the free will debate and debates about the nature of rationality. I see I have a Freudian slip here. Theism has custody. Theism does not have, <laughs> let me do it in all caps. Theism does not have, has, does not have custody. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that Trent himself thinks that theism does have custody over them, but I've argued that it's what he would have to defend if he wants his no-reason claim to have any weight whatsoever. Trent then says, Atheism cannot explain why there are some things we must never do, such as actively killing infants who have mild disabilities. Well, uh, here's a dandy explanation. There's something about the very nature of infants, something about how they are intrinsically and essentially, that grounds or explains or accounts for why it's wrong to kill them. This has nothing to do with some extrinsic relation to God, or God's commands, or God's attitudes, or God's nature, or whatever. Perhaps their flourishing and languishing conditions, set by their intrinsic characters, ground the impermissibility of this action. Or perhaps their human nature, with its intrinsic value and dignity grounded, which in turn are grounded in the various powers and capacities I mentioned earlier. Or perhaps it's their essential capacities, or whatever, right? There are so many dandy explanations! Okay. <sighs> And none of them make any reference to some kind of extrinsic relation to God or God's commands and so on. So I just find this so implausible, man. Okay. Um, now, interestingly, at least traditional Christian theism cannot explain cases of things we must never do. So turning the, t the tables have turned, the turns have tabled. Um, here's something we should never do. Commit genocide or drown innocent babies in a worldwide or even localized flood or enshrining in law that stoning could legitimately be used as a punishment or what have you. But Yahweh is depicted in the Bible as sanctioning, or in some cases inflicting, like the, the flood, precisely these sorts of things. See Dr. Randall Rouser, a Christian professor, by the way, he's, he's also a philosopher and theologian and so on. See Randall Rouser's excellent recent work, for example, his book Jesus Loves Canaanites, criticizing genocide apologists and others who try to water down Old Testament violence. I'm not claiming that um, Trent is a genocide apologist. I'm not. I'm not. Let me repeat that. I'm not claiming that Trent is a genocide apologist. But... It's going to be very difficult to uh, preserve traditional Christian views 
uh, of the Old Testament, given all the stuff that is depicted in there, um, and given that <laughs> we should never, given that the rather self-evident claim that we should never commit genocide or drown innocent children and animals in a flood, or given that we should, you know, it's just not permissible to enshrine in law that stoning could legitimately be used as a punishment. Um, now, uh, is this a cheap shot? Okay, maybe. Maybe fine. Maybe this is a little bit of a cheap shot, but it's a serious problem, and it often gets overlooked in debates about moral arguments for theism. So, now, let's return to stage two. So, he gives a, he, he, he does a quick turnaround to stage two at the end. He says, um, badness or evil are not positive things, they are privations of the good. Uh, now, first, Trent merely asserts that badness or evil are privations. He doesn't justify it. So, yeah. Uh, they, there are also quite serious challenges to such a view, as Alex Proust outlines in the first two-thirds of one of his recent lectures um, that happened in... I think July, maybe, um, this July. So click on that, you can watch it. Second, the inference here is extremely limited, right? Uh, he, he, well, I guess I didn't specify the inference. He want, Trent wants to infer the goodness of God, right? Or the, of the purely actual being, because badness or evil are not positive things, they're privations. Um, but whatever's purely actual doesn't have any privation of being. And so in some sense, it would be good. Um, and maybe even fully good. Um, so anyway, yeah, that, that's the inference. Um, now, as Phaser puts it, um, so I'm going to criticize Phaser's inference to goodness. Phaser basically argues that because being less than fully good means having some privation, and because having some privation entails failing to realize or actualize some potential feature that is proper to a thing, it follows, so Phaser argues, that the purely actual being is fully good. Now, Phaser himself recognizes the limitations of this line of reasoning, however. He writes that the sense of good and bad operative here is the one that is operative when we speak of a good or bad specimen, a good or bad instance of a kind of thing. By itself, then, this inference is unable to establish the purely actual being's moral goodness, and in particular the kind of omnibenevolence we want to ascribe to God. Indeed, it's not even clear how the inference to fully good is any difference from Phaser's inference to maximally perfect. Uh, I guess I don't give you guys any context here, but, but anyway, uh, both of them argue that the purely actual being fully realizes the ends set by its nature, as it were, and hence that it is maximally perfect, as it were, and fully good. But this account of goodness would entail that, for instance, an exact geometric circle, not the approximations we draw or print, would be fully good, right? They also have no privations. And so, uh, what, are they omnibenevolent? Are they fully good? Are they morally good? No. Um, so, like, this would seem to entail, absurdly, that a perfectly geometric circle is fully good. I mean, okay, fine, if you want to use goodness in that sense, but then it's, I mean, then I, I don't, then you haven't gotten to any uniquely divine characteristic, any interesting divine characteristic. Uh, moreover, we could imagine a being like McSwitch, whose sole causal power is to flip a switch, and we can suppose that McSwitch just eternally and timelessly fully actualizes this sole causal power. It's the sole end set by its intrinsic nature or character. Per this account of goodness, it has no privation or whatever, and so it, then it would be fully good. But, I mean, come on. That, that just seems implausible. I mean, maybe you're going to say, okay, it's fully good in this very technical sense of good, um, that, you know, that, that Phaser and Oderberg and Trent are using. But if that's the case, well, then again, you haven't gotten to any uniquely divine attribute or any interesting, religiously significant, distinctive divine attribute. Um, I, yeah, anyway, let's move on. So Trent, in the closing of his opening statement, he says, when all these arguments are seen as a whole, they form a strong case that there is a changeless, timeless, immaterial, infinite, necessary, all-powerful, all-good cause of the universe, or what most people refer to as God. Now, if I may get somewhat polemical, I say that they form a staggeringly weak case that God exists. In fact, if they're strong, as Trent suggests, then, as I've argued, they likewise form a strong case against Christianity. All right. Um, so here, is, now let's go on to the first rebuttal, uh, Trent's first rebuttal. So on low probability, Trent says, naturalism and supernaturalism are equally probable intrinsically. So if theism makes supernaturalism more likely because its added facts provide ultimate explanations and are more coherent, then theism's intrinsic probability isn't hindered compared to naturalism. So that's not true. Yes, theism makes supernaturalism more probable. In fact, it entails supernaturalism. But theism is still a very small subset of the probability space occupied by supernaturalism, since there are boatloads of other non-theistic but supernaturalistic views. Suppose, so Trent's claim here is just mistaken. Suppose I have 10 red balls labeled 1 through 10, and you have 10 blue balls labeled 11 through 20. Now suppose a meanie comes along and steals 9 of my red balls. So someone's taken my balls, man, uh, leaving me with red ball number 2. Now suppose that the quantity of our balls, get your mind out of the gutter, dictates the probability, dictates the probability, the, prob the probability that we win a lottery. 
Suppose you reason as follows. Well, the probability that a blue ball wins is one half, and the probability that a red ball wins is one half. But Joe only has a small subset of red balls. Hence, when comparing the probability that Joe wins to the probability that a blue ball wins, Joe, Joe's winning is far less probable. But now suppose Trent responds as follows. Well, blue balls winning and red balls winning are equally intrinsically probable outcomes. So if Joe's having ball number one, which is red, it makes it more likely that he has a red ball, then Joe's intrinsic probability of winning isn't hindered compared to the probability that a blue ball will win. Now this is just mistaken, as I hope is clear. Since while having my ball since while my having ball number one makes it probable and indeed entails that I have a red ball, my portion of the red probability space is still tiny, right? And hence I lose to the prob to the blue probability space. Thus, theism, since it is a highly specific hypothesis within the supernaturalism probability space and occupies only a small subset of the range of possible supernaturalist views, theism loses out to naturalism in terms of its intrinsic probability. Or so Ben's argument goes, right? I'm simply pointing out that Trent's rejoinder here fails. I'm not here to defend Trent's point, uh, even though I probably in the end I ultimately happen to agree with it because I'm broadly Draperian. Um, he brings his cat to class. Well, I, it's Zoom class, by the way. But he, he does bring his cat to class, and he, like, pets it beforehand. The cat's name is Professor, by the way. That's, that's so based, man. Okay, anyway. Yeah, yeah, I do take classes with Draper. He's, he's, he's as legendary as he sounds. Um, <laughs> anyway, he's awesome. Yeah, I love, love um, Paulito Burrito. Okay. I hope he doesn't watch this and see that. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, I'm not here defending Ben's, arg defending Ben's argument simpliciter. I'm defending it against Trent's bad rejoinder, or at least rejoinder that's bad by my lights, as I just argued. Trent then says, if something obtains in more possible worlds, it has a higher intrinsic probability. First, what I want to say is higher compared to what? Like anything that's non-necessary? Well, that can't be right, since there is a necessarily existent unicorn that is able to shoot rainbows out of its nostrils um, be thankful that I picked nostrils here. It's able to shoot rainbows out of its nostrils, but only if it is accompanied by exactly 13 universes within a multiverse. Uh, that's much less intrinsically probable than humans exist, even though the former is ex-hypothesizing necessary while the latter isn't. What really matters is the specificity of our hypothesis, right? How much does it say about the world? More specific hypotheses are less probable, since they have more epistemically possible ways of being wrong. Right? Trent gave an example of a cat is outside versus a pink cat is outside, and said that the reason the former is more probable than the latter is that the former obtains in more possible worlds than the other. But the reason it's more probable is that it is less specific. It makes fewer claims, and hence has less ways of being wrong. As shown by the unicorn example above, necessity isn't what explains this. It is, in large part, the specificity of the hypothesis that explains it. And so Trent's claim is false. Trent then says, finally, if simplicity in increases probability, then an appeal to a simple god increases theism's intrinsic probability. No, no it doesn't. Uh, the simplicity of hypothesis is what matters. Not the simplicity in the sense of lacking parts of a being. It's the hypothesis. These are entirely separate notions, right? In fact, classical theists have a simple being, right? But their hypothesis concerning it is wildly non-simple, right? For while the being isn't composed of parts, it nevertheless satisfies whole swaths of predicates, like omniscient, omnipotent, fully good, simple, immutable, impassable, timeless, knows contingent things somehow, even though it doesn't have any, <laughs> even though its contingent knowledge is somehow entirely extrinsic to it, and so on. The hypothesis says a ton, even though what it says doesn't correspond to parts of a being. It is this that makes the hypothesis suffer a probability cost. This has nothing to do with the simplicity of a being. The simplicity of a hypothesis is what matters, not the simplicity of a being. <sighs> Sorry, I'm getting frustrated, but that's because... <laughs> I get frustrated when I think things are very wrong. Um, okay, Trent then says, uh, Naturalism must posit things like brute facts and fundamental particles to explain the existence of the universe. Okay, so maybe Trent simply means brute fact as a fact that doesn't have some further explanation. Okay, sure, then naturalism must posit that, but so does theism. God's existence, right? Uh, God's existence has no further explanation. If you think it's explained by God's necessity or his pure actuality or whatever, you would be one wrong since God must already exist if he's to be purely actual, etc. And two, my point just would then just apply to the fact that you think explains God's existence. Okay, so that rejoinder doesn't work. If, by brute fact, on the other hand, he means a contingent fact that has no explanation, then naturalism doesn't have to posit that. Naturalism is a perfectly happy bedfellow with a necessarily naturalistically kosher foundation. And finally, naturalism doesn't have to posit fundamental particles. It could posit, say, a single universal wave function of the foundation, or a single quantum field, or whatever. Okay, on to animal suffering. Okay, so, okay, so I, let's grab my um, if we compare the theories, right, um, okay, Trent, if they, uh, he says, if they don't feel pain, then they're not really animals, they're not responding in an animal-like way, 
Um, but that's the whole point, right? God created things that feel pain and then directed a grueling process by which they are systematically discarded, pred predated upon, starve, and so on, right? With all their attendant suffering. The point of the argument is precisely to argue that God shouldn't have done this, right? He shouldn't have created animals as we know them. So yeah, of course they wouldn't be like, they wouldn't really be animals, at least as we know them. That's the whole point, right? He shouldn't have created animals as we know them. Or at least so the argument goes, right? I'm not here defending the argument simpliciter. I'm defending it against a mistaken criticism. There are entirely conceivable ways, moreover, God could achieve his goals for humanity in particular, at least, without directing and providentially governing a bloodbath for hundreds of millions of years. God could have, for example, created humans from the get-go, or he could have had a long physical and geological evolutionary process with no bloodbath, and after that long, after that log, after that long and protracted process, he then creates humans and other animals. Or he could have created things exactly as he did, but in which animal populations are controlled not, the population numbers are controlled not by starvation and predation, <laughs> predication. <laughs> you can see I wrote this at like 1 a.m. Um, Right? Or he could have created things exactly as he did, but in which animal populations are controlled not by starvation and predation and whatnot with their attendant misery, but instead with, say, fixed birth rates or fixed death rates with a rather swift, automatic, painless death or with some kind of natural contraceptive or whole panoplies of things. Right? The maker of chess wasn't constrained or bound by the rules of chess. And similarly, God isn't constrained or bound by the rules of the evolutionary game he created. The whole point is that God should have changed the rules. As I think of it, it's a deontological requirement on divine providence, undergirded by, depending on how the argument runs, phenomenal conservatism, or perhaps a Bayesian argument or whatever. Trent gives an example, right? We wouldn't think, well, he gives an example to, to in response to uh, Ben's case from animal suffering. He says we wouldn't think it immoral to terraform a planet and then later leave its animals there to languish. And so similarly, right, God is permissible, er, God is permitted to allow the languishing of sentient creatures and whatnot. For me, though, I see this as unconvincing. Again, I, I just want to say for the audience, uh, I'm not here defending Ben's arguments simpliciter. I'm defending them against Trent's criticisms. It's similar to how I oftentimes defend classical... Well, in this case, it's it's not exactly similar to that, but it's similar to how I often defend classical theism from arguments I think are bad against it. Uh, even though I'm not myself a classical theist. So I'm not, I'm not here claiming that I accept Ben's argument. I'm just defending it against Trent's criticisms. Okay, so I say this is unconvincing. For starters, we don't, we don't think this, right? We don't think it's immoral for us to do this because it isn't feasible for us to do that. But by contrast, suppose it were feasible. Suppose that by the, by the flick of snapping your finger, <laughs> suppose, suppose that by the snapping of your finger, you could put an early end to the lengthy starvation period of some of the sentient creatures on that planet. Would you do it? Of course you would, right? Yes, you can say God has good reasons of which we are unaware for not doing that, but then you've appealed to a different response and have abandoned the analogy to terraforming, right? The whole point of the analogy was to show that we already think it's permissible for us to allow languishing of animals. The problem with the analogy, though, is that one, we aren't omnipotent, two, if we were, we would clearly do something about their languishing, and three, we, weren't, we aren't the makers of the very rules by which such ecosystems operate. Death, privation, parasitism, starvation, disease, natural disaster, and so on. So yes, we would let it operate in the only way it can, given the rules of the game. But God, unlike us, is not bound by the rules of the game, since he is the very maker of the rules in the first place. The objection is to the rules themselves, not the gameplay once the rules are fixed. Trent then says if animals have an enduring sense of self, they might be compensated in an afterlife. Importantly though, compensation isn't justification. Suppose I bash your left arm to pieces, for the fun of it. After you recover from your months in the hospital, I decide to compensate you with, say, a, ba ba a bajillion dollars afterwards. I wrote a billion, but let's do a bajillion. That's, that's my favorite number. Bajillions. Now, you might be happy about this. You might even think that a bajillion dollars is worth more than what you went through. But the point is that while I compensated for the wrongdoing, I was not thereby justified in doing it. I still shouldn't have done what I did. It's a deontological constraint on my action. And similar points can apply if I just watched and allowed someone else bash your, your arm to shoulders. I, in this case, I wasn't the active participant doing it. I allowed someone else to do it. But still, compensation in that case isn't justification for me not preventing the person from bashing your arm to pieces. It's a deontological constraint of what I do. Trent then says God... Oh, so this is in response to uh, Ben's um, argument against freedom. And Trent says that... God has active potentialities, and thus, and this purportedly allows him to do otherwise than he does, right? So Ben's argument was essentially that God is purely actual, 
but then his will is devoid of any potentiality for being different, any contingency, and so his will is necessary. Um, and so in some sense, God couldn't do otherwise. That, that was Ben's argument. Uh, I'm not here defending the argument. I'm going to defend it against trans criticism. I've actually published a paper the, in the International Journal of Philosophy of Religion entitled The Fruitful Death and Modal Collapse Arguments, where I actually address um, an argument that's really, really, really similar to, to Ben's, and I criticize it. So you guys can check that out. Um, importantly, though, contra Trent, active potentialities, as Phaser points out, are still a kind of actuality, right? Ben's point is that God cannot be in any other way than he in fact is, since that would entail cross-world variance in how God is, which would entail some actual aspect of him in one world that isn't actual in the other world. In other words, a potential, right? And since, Ben argues, having leeway freedom requires one's will, and hence some aspect of oneself, it requires that can be other than it in fact is, it follows that God lacks leeway freedom under classical theism. That was Ben's argument. Pinpointing a distinction between active potentialities and passive potentialities is irrelevant to that. Now note that I'm not here defending the argument simpliciter, I'm defending it against a mistaken criticism. Now let's move on to Trent's second rebuttal. Oh no, this one was rough. Okay. Uh, Trent says existential inertia is not well studied. This is wrong. There have been lots of papers published on existential inertia from a variety of perspectives. And indeed, I have a systematic 60,000 word blog post, scholarly blog post that addresses the whole debate. I also have a 150,000 word blog, uh, blog. I also have a 150,000 word book manuscript under review entitled Existential Inertia and Classical Theistic Proofs. Uh, and moreover, even if it weren't well studied, that's irrelevant. Um, and, I mean, if this isn't well studied, I don't know what is. So in my blog post, a scholarly blog post, by the way, I'll go through common mistakes, uh, including multiple ones that uh, Trent commits in this debate. Second, the basics of existential inertia. Three, clarifying the existential inertia thesis to talk about scope, its relation to persistence and relativity theory, the modal register of the thesis, what it takes to, de um, or what the kind of dependence it denies of the objects in its quantificational domain, what destruction is. I uh, cover different metaphysical accounts. This is a very brief section. I then rigorously articulate existential inertia under different temporal ontologies. And then finally, I go, not finally, uh, and then I go through a variety of different metaphysical accounts of existential inertia, after which I start to motivate existential inertia and give a variety of arguments in its favor uh, and compare it to classical theism and so on. And then finally, I go through, systematically proceed through pretty much most, if not all, of the extant arguments in the literature. Uh, yeah, and then I give resources at the end, which kind of shows that it it's false to say that it's not well studied because I give <laughs> give lots of stuff here. Anyway, Trent then says existential inertia doesn't tell us if an ultimate theory is true. Rather, our ultimate theories tell us whether existential inertia is true or not. First, this is just a bald assertion. I'm not sure how Trent can get away with just flatly asserting things, but oh well. Second, EIT is is itself a piece of metaphysics, right? It is itself an ultimate theory of persistence. And so it's not as though it is beholden to some deeper theory that tells us whether or not existential inertia is true. Yeah, I mean, most of our metaphysical theories are going to have to be beholden to our total set of evidence. I mean, if that's what he means, then yeah, I mean, that's that's uninteresting. But existential inertia is itself purported to be an ultimate theory of persistence. And so it, it would, it does tell us if an ultimate theory is true. Anyway, uh, um, if true, it tells us that an ultimate theory is true because it is itself an ultimate theory of persistence. Third, even granting what Trent says here, what's the problem? I mean, Trent said that there were many problems with existential inertia. This was supposed to be one of them. He was listing off potential problems. What's the problem here? There, there's no criticism of, of existential inertia here, and nor is there any engagement with the arguments in favor of existential inertia. Fourth, existential inertia need only be offered as an undercutting defeater of Trent's premise, demanding a sustaining cause, something that Trent's argument requires to be false, but for which Trent has given those who accept or are neutral on existential inertia thesis no reason, or at least insufficient reason, to abandon their position. In that case, the onus is on Trent to give those who don't already accept his premise sufficient reason to abandon their view. Merely gesturing towards existential inertia's EIT's dependence on some ultimate theory is utterly irrelevant to that. Interestingly, Trent cites Paul Audi, but then almost in the next breath, he goes on to cite the second law of thermodynamics as a problem for existential inertia, but Paul Audi rejects, <laughs> explicitly rejects an argument from the second law against existential inertia. And moreover, the second law is not at all a problem for existential inertia. Existential inertia is perfectly compatible with things as ceasing to exist when subject to sufficiently destructive factors, whether external or internal. And this is exactly what happens when things undergo a process of entropic decay. They are causally destroyed by an increase in disorder among their constituent parts in their environment. So, far from disconfirming existential inertia thesis, it only confirms one of its predictions, that some things go out of existence only when subject to sufficiently destructive factors, whether internal or external. What's more, Thomistic philosopher David Oderberg, in his 2014 article in the American Philosophical Quarterly, which is available on his website, he's pointed out that a tendency for decay only makes sense if there's a complement tendency to persist, uh, when not subject to those in, uh, entropic factors.
And it, so anyway, see his article there. Um, note, existential inertia, moreover, doesn't necessarily commit to a tendency to persist. See my blog post uh, earlier that I linked. Um, there are a whole panoply of existential inertialist metaphysical accounts, only a few of which adduce some kind of tendency or disposition. Uh, finally, this only applies to physical objects, but existential inertia thesis can be true if there is some non-physical temporal object that persists in the absence of external sustenance and destruction. For example, the neoclassical theistic god or some naturalistic necessary foundation uh, or, or um, that, that's not itself uh, physical, say. It could be the neutral monist substance. I mean, maybe that counts as a, a non-naturalistic view, but um, anyway. Trent then says, the fact that you can know a thing's essence without knowing its existence counts against the view that objects possess a tendency to persist. Uh, no, no, it doesn't. First, this relies on highly contentious domestic views about essence and existence, which are baldly asserted here, no justification given, um, that proponents of existential inertia thesis need not accept. Second, this is just wrong. Sure, we might be able to know something's essence without knowing that it exists at all in the first place, but it's an entirely separate question whether we could know its essence without knowing that once it exists, it will persist in the absence of external sustenance and destruction. And if Trent asserts that we can know something's essence without knowing that once it exists, it will persist in this manner, then he simply begged the question against the proponent of the existential inertia thesis. For the EIT view is precisely one according to which this is part of the essences of things within the quantificational domain of EIT. More precisely, it's only, that's only true under some metaphysical accounts of EIT. Uh, others cite facts to explain persistence, such as transtemporal relations or facts about the nature of change or, su or cessation and so on. So they, they don't need some kind of um, uh, tendency or, or what have you. Third, third, even if you can know something's essence without knowing its existence, this only means that we need some explanation of why it exists, and in particular why it exists at some non-first time t of its existence. But there are whole swaths of inertialist friendly explanations of the existence of an object at non-first times at which it exists. Again, see section 5 of my blog article linked above, so you think you understand existential inertia. A far too brief summary here. You could adduce a tendency or disposition to persist in existence, a la tendency disposition accounts. You could adduce transtemporal explanatory relations obtaining among the, among the successive stages of objects' lives or among their temporal parts, a la transtemporal accounts. You could adduce laws of nature that govern or otherwise explain the evolution of systems and or objects over time. Those laws of nature need not themselves be temporal. Perhaps they are non-spatio-temporal. Uh, and so they themselves, you're not just presupposing the prior persistence of things. You could have uh, the primitive metaphysical necessity of the inertial thesis, a la propositional necessity counts. You could have the metaphysically necessary existence of some foundational temporal concrete object or objects, such as the neoclassical theistic god or various naturalist friendly proposals, a la objectual necessity counts. And you could have persistence being the absence of change, and so adequately explained by the absence of sufficiently destructive change inducing factors, a la no change accounts. Again, this is a far too brief summary, and there are multiple accounts within each of these. Uh, and so, there are whole swaths of inertialist friendly explanations of the existence of an object at non-first times at which they exist. And so even if, even if I granted that um, all this stuff about you can know its essence without knowing that it exists and so on, and ignoring the fact that we're, an intentional con we're in an intentional context here and so on, um, about, you know, the Superman Clark Kent stuff, um, even ignoring all that stuff, I I'm not going to go, go through that, intent that'd take me way too far afield, but even ignoring all that stuff, all we get to here is that we therefore need some kind of explanation of why that essence is in reality, right? and in particular why it persists. But there are whole swaths of inertialist friendly explanations of persistence that do not adduce some kind of sustaining efficient cause. Trent then rehashes Fazer's argument that EIT existential inertia entails a vicious circle. It doesn't. I've shown this ad nauseum elsewhere. In fact, this almost made the top of my list as the biggest mistakes made by critics of existential inertia. He argues that existential inertia would have to be a property, but properties depend on their substances. Um, but yet the property is supposed to be explaining the existence and or maybe persistence of the substance. Um, in which case you have a kind of vicious circle. Um, firstly, it's a mistake to say that existential inertia is a property. Um, Ed Fraser, for instance, has had this. So this is from that blog post that I had, so you think you understand existential inertia. Um, Ed Fazer has said this, and, you know, uh, Trent is borrowing from Fazer's argument here, and I've argued at length that he's mistaken on many fronts here. The first mistake in this thought is its failure to disambiguate existential inertia. Uh, it could refer either to the thesis or the phenomenon. The former obviously isn't a property, right? It's just a thesis that purports to describe the way that things persist. But the phenomenon of inertial persistence by itself doesn't entail that there is some property exemplified by concrete objects corresponding to or accounting for inertial persistence. What would such a property even amount to? What, the property of being such as to persist in the absence of both external sustenance and sufficiently destructive factors, that's a ludicrously gerrymandered property. There is no such property as that. Moreover, nothing in EIT, the thesis, as such, entails that inertial persistence is a property or attribute exemplified by temporal concreta. 
Uh, it's and as we'll see when discuss as we've seen so far, um, when we discuss metaphysical accounts of EIT, we see that it's simply false that existential inertia thesis requires there to be some attribute or property corresponding to inertial persistence and which accounts for their inertial persistence. And here is why trends, that is, Fraser's vicious circularity argument fails. So I already kind of explained it there, but um, I'll explain it further in what I say below because this is important that you understand it. So um, Fazer charges that EIT is viciously circular, applying his objection to an example of a contingent substance, namely water. He writes, existential inertia would be a property or power of the water. So the water's persistence from T minus 1 to T would, on this account, depend on, the on this property or power. But properties and powers depend for their reality on the substances that possess them. So we seem to have a situation where the water's persistence depends on that of a property or power, which in turn depends on the persistence of the water. Now I have several responses to this vicious circularity objection. Ah, man, I need to go get a charger. Okay, peeps, we're almost done. I got my charger. Uh, things sound a little bit differently because I had to move. Um, I had to move in order to be able to plug this in. Um, so, okay, I have several responses to this. First, few, if any, of the metaphysical accounts of EIT developed in my chapter five, and in particular in section five of that blog post, treat inertial persistence as a property or power of substances, right? Disposition, tendency, tendency disposition accounts can be cast in metaphysically lightweight terms that commit to the existence of neither a property nor power corresponding to inertial persistence. In fact, Bodoin's tendency disposition account merely cited the absence of a tendency to expire in conjunction with the non-exercise of potentially destructive factors. Again, see that blog post, section five. Similarly, transtemporal accounts, like the transtemporal explanations, which I'm going to point to below, do not postulate a property or power of a substance that explains its persistence. Instead, what explains persistence is trans transtemporal explanatory, for example, causal connections that relate the successive phases of, phases of objects as lives. Law-based accounts cite laws of nature, and many such accounts do not treat laws as properties or powers of substances. Clearly, neither objectual, objectual nor propositional necessity accounts treat inertial persistence as a property or power of substances. And finally, no-change accounts, like the no-change explanations adduced below, uh, make no appeal to properties or powers of substances. And so Fazer's criticism and Trent's criticism here has no teeth against existential inertia. To drive this point home, consider again, let's consider an explanandum and two explanands. These are just two out of the panoply of inertialist friendly explanations of persistence. So here's the explanandum, the thing that we want to explain. S is existence, so S is a substance, M is a moment, okay? So the explanandum is S is existence at M. Now, here's an explanation for that. One, there is an absence of sufficiently destructive causally, <laughs> there is an absence of sufficiently causally destructive factors operative on S from M minus one to M, where M minus one is the moment immediately prior to M. And two, the state and or existence of temporal concrete objects, or at least those within EIT's quantificational domain at a given moment at which they exist, causally produces their existence at the next moment, provided that no sufficiently causally destructive factors are operative. Uh, you can see that footnote later. And then, so that's one, one kind of explanations that we might proffer. Again, my point here is not to positively justify the explanations, it's just to point out that there are perfectly consistent, inertialist friendly explanations of persistence that aren't viciously circular. There, there's nothing vicious, uh, anyway, I'll get to that, but there's nothing viciously circular in either of these. Now consider this explanations. One, S existed immediately before M, that is, at M minus one. Two, if S existed immediately before M, but fails to exist at M, then S's cessation is, or involves, or entails a change. Three, nothing causally induces S's cessation at M minus one or M, that is, nothing, nothing destroyed S from the immediately prior moment M minus one through M. And four, a change occurs only if some factor causally induces Produces said change. Uh, again, you can see earlier in this, uh, earlier in my video here, where I pointed you guys to certain objections. You know, remember when I was talking about how uh, the causal principle of the Aristotelian proof entails existential inertia? That's going to be relevant here as well, because I go through different objections to this p potential explanations. But the objections don't work, so you don't really have to worry too much about it. But uh, if you're curious to look into it, you can you can do that. Uh, so for Fazer's circularity objection to work and for Trent's circularity objection to work, the explanatory facts in each explanand here must presuppose the explanatorily or ontologically prior obtaining of the explanandum. But that is simply untrue. It's clear from inspection that neither transtemporal explanands nor no-change explanands presuppose the prior reality or obtaining of explanandum. In other words, none of the explanatory facts are dependent upon S's existence at M. 
And in that case, Phasers and Trent's allegation of viciously circular explanatory dependence has no teeth against such explanants. It is simply false of both explanants that there is some property or power that both explains and is explained by some fact. And the other metaphysical accounts likewise do not fall prey to charges of vicious circularity. Again, see my blog post. Section 5. Here's another response to Phaser's, Phaser's and Trent's vicious circularity charge. Suppose, contrary to what I believe, that existential inertia is a property. This would only be problematic if we accepted the controversial thesis that properties ground character. That is, that it is in virtue of possessing, exemplifying, or instantiating, say, the property redness, that something is red. But suppose we reject this thesis and instead adopt its opposite. It is rather in virtue of being red that something possesses the property redness. Under this anti-character grounding view, it is simply false, Pache, Phaser, and Trent, that existential inertia as being a property entails that the water exists at m or persists from m minus 1 to m because it has the property of existential inertia. Rather, the substance has the property of existential inertia because it exists at m or persists from m minus 1 to m in an inertial fashion. So even if tr existential inertia were a property, by the way, it's not, Phaser's argument and Trent's argument still fails. Trent also rehashes yet another of Phaser's, Phaser's arguments against existential inertia, which I've already addressed at length. Here's my response. So Phaser offers an argument against existential inertia from contingent natures. He begins with the following illustration. To take an example I've often used, suppose you explain to someone who has never heard of them before, a young child, say, the nature or essence of a lion, of a T-Rex, and of a unicorn. Then you tell him that of these three animals, one exists, one used to exist, but has gone extinct, and the other never existed and is fictional. You ask him to tell you, based on his new knowledge of the essences of each, which is which, naturally he couldn't tell you, for there is nothing in the essence or nature of these things that could by itself tell you whether or not it exists. Existence is something additional to the essence of a contingent thing. It doesn't follow from such a thing's essence. But suppose I granted all this, right? All the child should conclude is that precisely because there is nothing about a contingent thing or its nature that tells us whether it exists, there must be some other factor that explains why the contingent thing exists. In other words, we simply need some reason why the contingent thing is in reality at all. But this, of course, is, is an entirely separate question from why, once in existence, the thing continues to exist. And indeed, I would argue that the child would recognize the plausibility of existential inertia as applied to such continued existence. Consider the following dialogue between me and the child. Uh, suppose something S exists immediately before a given moment M. Now, for S to fail to exist at M, despite existing immediately before M, is for some kind of change to occur. Of course, it's not as though S undergoes some alteration in this process, since S doesn't become something different, but still, there is some kind of change here. Whether in the ontological inventory of what there is, or in the incorporation of what were previously S's parts into, some, into parts of something else, or in the passing away of a state, or whatever. The child says, that seems reasonable to me. Now I'll go back to my normal voice. But, the, but changes of state, that is, cases where some new state comes to be or some old state passes away, plausibly require some cause. It's not as though a raging tiger could just spring into existence in this room right now, right? That would require some cause. Child, yeah, that, that changes of state seem to require causes. Me, so if there is no cause that induces the relevant change of state, then there won't be such a change. That follows. So if there is no cause that induces S to cease to exist at M, that is, if there is, no, if there is nothing that comes along to destroy S, then S will not cease to exist at M. And in that case, S will persist to M. For you granted earlier that S is failing to exist at M, despite existing before M, constitutes some kind of change. In particular, it's a change of state, in the sense of an old state passing away. And in that case, we get the conclusion that so long as nothing destroys S from immediately before M through M, S will exist at M. We derive this in a manner that removes mystery as to why and how S exists at M. That makes sense. Now, in this obviously gerrymandered conversation, we have a seemingly perfectly illuminating, inertialist friendly explanation of why S exists at M once S is in existence. The explanation tells us precisely how and why S exists at M, and whether or not existence follows from the essence of a contingent thing is entirely irrelevant to this point. Uh, Phaser continues with his objection, the point for the moment is this, if nothing about the essence or nature of a thing entails that it exists at all in the first place, then it's hard to see how anything about its essence or nature could entail that it will persist in existence once it exists. But, by way of response, nothing in the exchange above assumes that it was something about the essence or nature of the contingent thing that explains why the object persists. Totally separate explanatory facts were cited, and so Phaser's point doesn't support. It doesn't support the denial of EIT, right? And my points here don't merely apply to the no change account proffered in the above dialogue, that this is a kind of no change account of existential inertia. The same holds true of other metaphysical accounts of EIT. Even those who accept tendency disposition accounts on which things have an inertial tendency by nature should not be convinced by what Phaser says. They will simply retort that if you leave out a tendency to persist in your description of their essences, then your description is simply incomplete. I make two final points in response. First, Phaser's argument rests on a non sequitur. From the fact that nothing about the nature of a contingent object entails that it exists, 
It simply doesn't follow that nothing about the nature of a contingent object entails that once in existence it will persist in the absence of both destruction and external sustenance. Indeed, instances of this inference schema are clearly false. Consider that by Phaser's own lights, nothing about the nature of a contingent object entails that it exists. But it is nevertheless false, again by Phaser's own lights, that nothing about the nature of a contingent object entails that once in existence it will lapse into non-being unless sustained by God. Thus, merely from the fact that merely from the fact that nothing about the nature of a contingent object entails that it exists, it does not follow that nothing about the nature of a contingent object entails that once in existence the object is or will be f for some predicate f. Second, suppose, contrary to what I've argued, that Phaser did show or render plausible the claim that contingent things do not enjoy existential inertia. That by itself doesn't entail that EIT is false, for EIT quantifies over a subset of temporal concrete objects. The inertialist could simply hold that while contingent things do not inertially persist. Uh, again, uh, my point is that Phaser's argument fails, okay? So, so this, this, is not, this is not an option that the inertialist needs to take, that I'm outlining right here. But suppose, contrary to what I've argued, that his, his argument doesn't fail, okay? Then the inertialist can still accept that every contingent thing is sustained from without, right? Because EIT quantifies only over a subset of temporal concrete objects. And so, so long as there is some foundational necessarily existent temporal concrete objects that, uh, that don't, aren't continuously externally sustained from without, we have the truth of EIT, right? Theist friend, there are theist-friendly examples, there are non-theist-friendly examples, and so on. And so in this case, it is false that nothing about the necessary foundation demands its existence or persistence. Indeed, the opposite is true. And hence, if even, and hence, even if, contrary to what I've argued, Phaser's argument works, EIT is not threatened. Uh, to be sure, Phaser might induce other arguments, uh, claiming that only the classical theistic god could be necessarily existent, but then that's a separate argument from the one under consideration. And my sole purpose here is to point out that the argument under consideration need not move an inertialist to abandon their position. Okay, so Trent's case for existential inertia didn't work at all. Um, and, well, his case for God didn't work either, and perhaps he's furnished us with a potentially powerful argument against Christianity. Anyway, I got excited in this video at points, and so if it sounded like I was being rude or things like that, please don't take it that way. Uh, I hope Trent is able to watch this. I know Trent's, again, going to be making a response to my earlier response from way back when, maybe nine months ago or something, uh, to Cosmic Skeptic. I know he's going to be doing that uh, this coming Monday. Uh, but I predict that a lot of points that I make in here will be germane to what he says therein. Uh, and so, and, and secondly, um, what was I going to say? And secondly, I will be responding to uh, Trent's rejoinder to me at some point in the future, hopefully within the next few weeks or so. And it might be a response in the blog. So yeah, stay tuned. Stay tuned for that. We'll see. We'll see. But uh, anyway, I thank Trent for his, uh, you know, his case for God in his debate with Ben Watkins. I don't think it worked. Uh, I think every argument given didn't succeed. But again, I hope my video serves you guys in your pursuit of truth. And if, if Trent is watching this or watched this, I hope it serves Trent in his pursuit of truth. And I hope it really just, you know, advances the dialectic and allows people to think more critically and carefully and <laughs> cautiously about the fundamental nature of reality. Anyway, I'm Joe Schmidt, this is The Majesty of Reason, and peace out. That's just beautiful. You love it. Uh, <laughs>